Good afternoon. Um, I'm Congressman Jim McGovern, a co-chair of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Commission's first hearing of the 117th Congress. I'd like to extend my special a special welcome to Senator Ben Cardin from the great state of Maryland, who will be testifying on the first panel today. Senator Cardin is one of the strongest human rights and anti-corruption advocates in the United States Congress, and he's a colleague and he's a friend. We worked together to introduce the first Magnitsky sanctions bill, the Sergei Magnitsky Rule of Law Accountability Act, which became law in December of 2012. Although its scope was limited to Russia instead of uh, global as we wanted, it was a crucial first step. Uh, after that success, we continued to work together um, along with uh, Congressman Smith on what became the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act of 2016. Our purpose today is to discuss how that statute uh, has worked in practice. So it's especially fitting that Senator Cardin is joining us. To review, the Global Magnits Magnitsky Act authorizes the President of the United States to impose what are known as Global Magnitsky Sanctions, denial of visas or entry to the U.S. and economic sanctions on persons responsible for certain human rights violations or corruption. Global Magnitsky passed as part of the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2017 and signed into law by President Obama. A year later, President Trump issued Executive Order 13818 to implement the act and broaden its scope in terms of who could be sanctioned and for what. We are living in partisan times, but Global Magnitsky sanctions have had broad bipartisan support from the very beginning. Congressman Chris Smith and I introduced the Global Magnitsky Bill in the House in the 114th Congress, and it went on to attract another 28 Republican and 39 Democratic co-sponsors. Senator Cardin was joined by four Republicans and four other Democrats when he introduced uh, in the Senate. Members on both sides of the aisle have strongly urged the executive branch to use sanctions. According to the Congressional Research Service, to date, Global Magnitsky sanctions have been imposed on 127 individuals and 117 entities in and around 30 countries. Just this week, the U.S. designated two Chinese officials for their role in the brutal repression of ethnic minorities in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Many members of Congress have added Magnitsky-style authorities to bills they introduced in response to specific situations or countries. Global Magnitsky sanctions have strong support among human rights and civil society organizations in the United States and abroad. Non-governmental groups from around the world have worked together to identify people and entities who should be sanctioned and to build case files to submit to Treasury and State for their consideration. My sense is that this kind of collaboration is something new uh, and that it has been both constructive and effective. And we've seen that legislation modeled on the Global Magnitsky Act is under consideration or has been approved in a number of places, most recently the European Union. I think it's fair to say that the Global Magnitsky Act has been a pretty successful initiative. But when the statute beca became law in 2016, it included a six-year sunset provision. That means Global Magnitsky sanctions will cease to be authorized by law at the end of 2022, unless Congress acts to reauthorize them. Senators Cardin and Wicker have introduced S-93 in the Senate to reauthorize the sanctions, and I'm working with Congressman Smith on a companion bill in the House. For this reason, we've convened today's hearing. In addition to Senator Cardin, we will hear from five distinguished witnesses who I will introduce shortly. They bring a wealth of experience as advocates for the use of sanctions and as former government officials charged with making the case to impose sanctions on designated persons. The witnesses will share their reflections on how global Magnitsky sanctions have been used over the last four years, whether and under what conditions the sanctions have achieved their objectives, how global Magnitsky sanctions relate to other efforts that share the goals of, the goals of ending human rights abuses and corruption, building rule of law and fulfilling victims' rights, and what changes or adjustments to the statute, if any, Congress should consider as reauthorization as the reauthorization process moves forward. I look forward to their recommendations. One last point in closing. There is a major debate underway about the use of sanctions in U.S. foreign policy. That debate is not driven by targeted sanctions programs like, the, like Global Mag Magnitsky. 
It is a response to the big increase in the use of sectoral and secondary sanctions during the Trump administration. Although the devastating humanitarian and foreign policy consequences of these types of sanctions need congressional attention, they are not the focus of this hearing. But I want to be clear that while I support the use of smart, targeted sanctions, I strongly oppose sanctions that try to achieve political outcomes by imposing prolonged hardships on entire societies. I think that they're immoral and they don't work. Um, and so with that, I am now happy to turn over to the, turn the program over to the co-chair, uh, my colleague and friend from New Jersey, Congressman Chris Smith. Thank you very much, um, Chairman McGovern. It's a real privilege to be with you again. I thank you for your strong and consistent uh, work and collaboration over the years, especially on the Global Magnitsky Act. As I think you know, and everyone knows, when I introduced the Global Magnitsky Act in the 114th Congress, Jim was my lead Democratic co-sponsor. We are now working, as you pointed out, on reauthorization legislation, which you are leading, while I am the lead Republican co-sponsor. We also have similarly partnered on a number of other critical human rights uh, initiatives, especially as it regards to China, uh, Hong Kong, and Xinjiang, uh, the Uyghurs who are being uh, subjected to a genocide by Xi Jinping. Let me also thank my good friend and colleague, Senator Ben Cardin, for his extraordinary leadership as well. Uh, I know Ben for decades. We have worked, uh, and he has been, again, very, very effective, particularly in the area of combating anti-Semitism, where he's the special representative for the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Senator Wicker, and both of them have worked so well, first on the Sergei Magnitsky Rule of Law Accountability Act, and now, of course, on Global Magnitsky. It is important that we take this opportunity to take stock on how the Global Magnitsky Human Rights and Accountability Act has been applied. When we passed the act in 2016 as part of the NDAA, our intention was to disrupt the impunity and comfort that far too many international human rights violators currently enjoy and keep their tainted money out of our financial systems. We also wanted to fight the human rights abusers uh, and abuses and corruption that generate national security, terrorist, and economic threats to the United States. While I'm pleased that we have sanctioned a total of 240 of the world's worst human rights abusers from over 30 countries, I am concerned uh, that congressional intent has not been fully followed in the application of Global Magnitsky. My primary concern is that Executive Order 13818 has usurped uh, the field relying for authority, primarily upon the International Emergency Economic Powers Act uh, stretching IEPA far beyond its original intent to be employed in national emergencies. Moreover, the Global Magnitsky's gross violation of internationally recognized human rights standard, which reflects congressional intent to focus on the worst of the worst human rights abusers, has been disregarded uh, to a vague and amorphous serious human rights abuse standard. This is a problem. When we passed the Global Magnitsky Act, our intent was to anchor the act in internationally recognized standards so that the United States could maintain global leadership on human rights by changing the standard to serious violations and by trying to uh, tying the application of the global Magnitsky to the U.S. national emergency determination, we have disassociated it from the human rights norms around which the global community has formed a consensus. This gives abusers an avenue to characterize our actions as arbitrary and outside the consensus of the global community, deflecting attention from their actual bad acts. That we act with the imprimatur of a global consensus is even more imperative now as countries such as China mistakenly believe that genocidal regimes and not the world democracies uh, that respect human rights are on the right side of history. Now more than ever, we need to present our actions as reflecting a global consensus grounded in international treaties, not sanctions merely levied to advance American national interests. Moving forward with due regard to the concerns I've noted, I hope the State Department and Treasury will continue to sanction the world's worst human rights abusers and the purveyors of corruption. Here are some that I would like to call attention to. In Belarus, Mikhail Gutsensirev was responsible for quickly replacing Belarusian media personnel who walked off their jobs in disgust after the August uh, 2020 fake election which Russian lackeys who just parroted Lukashenko and the Kremlin's propaganda. Those lackeys later started a vicious campaign of lies against independent journalists and called for violence against the protesters. 
Alexander Mashinsky is reportedly responsible providing for providing bonus money for riot police engaged in the violent crackdown of protesters. We understand he is particularly vulnerable to the global Magnitsky sanctions since his company's products are widely sold in the West. Then there are the Kark brothers, whose services to brutal dictators go back to Slobodan Milosevic and now fund Lukashenko. In Africa, we have a special relationship with Liberia, which was founded by freed American slaves. Unfortunately, President George Weah leads a kleptocratic government that has been engaged in political corruption from the day he assumed office by depleting the government coffers for personal use while the people of Liberia suffer. Liberian Senator Varney Sherman was sanctioned last year by the Trump administration for corruption, which is a positive though, more needs to be done. In Nigeria, President Buhari has done little to staunch the Fulani extremist crimes against humanity, against the Christians and other religious minorities in the country's middle belt, which was a subject of a Lantos Commission hearing that I chaired in December. I asked that the State Department take a close look at the actions of Mieti Allah, the Cattlemen's Association, which allegedly has encouraged depredations by the Fulani extremists. In Turkey, finally, we have a chief advisor to President Erdogan, Mustafa Varanik, directing Turkish Airlines executives, uh, assistant May Mehmet uh, Karata, Karakas on tape to fly weapons to terrorists in Nigeria. Perhaps our witness will have names of their own that they would like to be tendered to, to the uh, administration that deserve closer scrutiny. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the testimony. And Ben, welcome, a very hearty welcome. Thank you very much, um, and appreciate your statement. And I'm and I'm trying to. I'm told that Sheila Jackson Lee may be uh, within these Hollywood squares that we have before us here today. Um, um, I don't. Let me just double check if she's. Um, uh, yeah, Chairman, I am here. Yeah, there you I are. Okay. Here. All right. I then I would. I am you here. Know, all right. Do you want a? Uh, do you do you have any? You want a, a brief opening or? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would. Thank you so very much. Thank you to you and uh, Mr. Smith for uh, convening the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission on this very uh, important issue, uh, and as well uh, dealing with the Global Magnitsky Act uh, and the specifics of this act. I'd like to remind the witnesses, and I know they know, that this act authorizes the president to impose such sanctions on any foreign person defined to include both individuals and entities identified as responsible for extrajudicial killings, torture, or other gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. Uh, and that could be against uh, individuals as well. As we've seen over the last couple of years, we have seen a roll call of gross incidences from continent to continent. One of the most notorious, of course, was the killing of the Washington Post journalists in Saudi Arabia by uh, the Saudi Arabians. Uh, that is the least of our worries as we look uh, to uh, situations dealing with uh, Russia's uh, attack on dissidents and the constant poisoning of those who would raise voices against the oppression of Russia. Additionally, we go to the continent of Africa. We will see a number of uh, terrorists rising, such as Boko Haram, and governments uh, not adhering to human rights and those who are opposing violent acts being subjected themselves to human rights abuses. This roll call must stop. And I believe that what we do today will be a vital aspect of digging deep into what more we can do to make this world a nicer, gentler place or a place that continues to recognize the human dignity of all persons. So let me thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate as a member of the commission of longstanding and to join in being a fact finder today by listening to the witnesses to find out um, why and how we can stop these heinous acts, how we can protect innocent persons. And let me, as I close, uh, indicate that as uh, then secretary or first lady, Hillary Clinton indicated, Human rights are women's rights. Women's rights are human rights. Uh, let me also emphasize 
uh, the violence that continues against women around the world. Uh, and that this should also be uh, hopefully in the midst of the discussion of witnesses who will be before us today. Women are particularly vulnerable and children and sometimes are at the brunt end of enormous heinous uh, human rights violations, uh, which are going on particularly now in Ethiopia and Eritrea. I'll be asking about the violence that is going on there where women are raped uh, continuously and obviously in violation of what we're here to discuss today. So Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much for yielding to me. I look forward to the vital testimony of these witnesses. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your statement and your and your leadership on these issues. Uh, it, it's, I'm trying to see everybody on uh, on the, on the screen here. Sometimes it's a little bit challenging. I was on no a problem, call, Mr. Chairman. I, I was on a, I was on a call with a group of college students from UMass and Smith College, and I said it was like 60 students. I said, this is like this is like Hollywood Squares. They all looked at me like I was like didn't know what I was talking about. And then I said, well, maybe I suppose like the Brady Bunch. And then half of them didn't know what I was talking about. So I feel old. But in any event, I'm now happy to turn to our, yeah, I'm happy to turn to our first panel, uh, which include which is Senator Ben Cardin. He's the senior senator from Maryland. He's a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and has been a commissioner on the U.S. Helsinki Commission since 1993. In 2015, he was named as the special representative on anti-Semitism, racism, and intolerance for the 57 nation. Organization Security and Cooperation in Europe Parliamentary Assembly. And as I mentioned before, he played a key and pivotal uh, and vital role in the um, formation of uh, the Magnitsky style sanctions at the very beginning. And uh, we're honored to have, have him here and a former colleague of the House, but I'm now happy to yield to uh, Senator Cardin. Well, Chairman McGovern, thank you very much. And thank you for your extraordinary leadership on behalf of human rights, to Chris Smith, my friend, a uh, long career for human rights, to Sheila Jackson Lee, who was, I've also joined internationally on human rights issues. It's good to be with all of you, and particularly the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. Um, I cherish the time I served with Tom Lantos in the House of Representatives, and I will always cherish the opportunities I had to be with him in fighting for human rights. In Budapest, we were together. In Moscow, we were together. And we raised the human rights issues. So it's always good to appear before the commission named after that human rights champion. And let me just point out the strength that you represent. Bipartisan legislative support for human rights makes a huge difference. Chris Smith's efforts on behalf of human trafficking has changed the landscape of the globe in fighting the modern surge of, of, of slavery. Uh, we can be very proud of those efforts. Jim McGovern's effort on behalf of Sergei Magnitsky originally made a difference. No one knew who Sergei Magnitsky was back then. Now, of course, it is synonymous with human rights and human rights champions. Our work makes major differences. And I am very proud of our ability to not only pass the Sergei Magnitsky statute originally uh, aimed at Russia, but the global Magnitsky statute. And you've mentioned some of the House members. I, I do want to acknowledge Senator Wicker and his, his work. I want to acknowledge the late Senator McCain and the work that he did in promoting the global Magnitsky statute. And there are so many others. Uh, it is now, as I said, the global standard for human rights. And we know how much attention it gets in, in individuals who don't want to be on that list. First of all, they want to have their unrestricted right to travel, and that's taken away from them if the Magnitsky statute uh, sanctions are opposed. And they cl clearly want to use the international banking system. And without the United States permission, that becomes um, pretty much uh, moot and academic. So we've been successful in getting this done. Uh, it also has gotten the attention of world leaders. It was reported, I think accurately, that in the first meeting with President Putin and President Trump, the first issue that President Putin raised was Magnitsky's uh, sanctions. So clearly, it's very, very effective. It's having an impact. It's affecting conduct. And U.S. leadership becomes absolutely essential. And the concept that's, that Congressman Smith talked about and mentioning names, it's name and shame. We always want to be able to come forward with specific names 
and let those individuals know that a spotlight's gonna be put on them because of their gross violations of human rights. And under US leadership, we've seen other countries follow the United States example, as you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, we've seen an action now in Canada, we've seen action in UK and EU and Baltic states have all followed and passed their version of global Nikniski. So we've made progress, but we still have a lot more we need to do. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from the witnesses as to the effectiveness, but also as to how we can expand the reach of global Nikniski. Obviously, we need other countries. We know it's under consideration in Australia, Japan, ta Taiwan, but we need to encourage those uh, countries to pass the global Nikniski statute. I worked with the European Council in order to get their action, uh, but yet more needs to be done. When we see political interference with the sanctions, and I, I know uh, Chris Smith re recognizes that under the Obama administration, we had that challenge in regards to the trafficking uh, uh, reports. We have the problem under the Trump administration in regards to Dan, Dan Gertler and giving him relief from the Magnitsky uh, sanctions that never should have been given. Damage was done, and I was pleased to see that President Biden corrected that. We have those who are involved in the tragic death of, uh, of Jamal Khashoggi, and yet we know uh, with the release of the report that there are those that were complicit that have not been sanctioned. That presents a void and something we need to talk about. The Khashoggi list developed by the State Department using additional uh, other uh, authorities, those names have not been made public. They claim they can't do it by law. Well, what name and shame is part of the issue. We need to know how we can make those types of individuals' uh, sanctions public. We also, as you have pointed out, well, we also have the Navalny tragedy in Russia. Uh, that's a perfect example where the Magnitsky statutes uh, sanctions should be applied. Uh, as you pointed out, we have a sunset on the global Magnitsky. We need to act. That's why Senator Wicker and I have introduced uh, legislation that makes it permanent and strengthens the legislation. Uh, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to your leadership and, and both of your leadership in, in making that permanent. Today, we are operating under an executive order, 13818. We need to have a statutory ongoing basis uh, for the global Magnitsky uh, statute. Uh, we also uh, need to deal with some of the weaknesses in some of the global statutes. For example, UK and Europe do not include corruption. Corruption is by far the fuel that fuels these uh, corrupt uh, anti-human rights policies of governments, the autocratic way they treat their citizens. And we need to make sure that's included uh, in uh, the legislation and our efforts to uh, affect other countries' actions. And Mr. Chairman, we should also be looking at additional tools. That's why Senator Young and I, bipartisan again, have filed legislation uh, that would set up a, a tip type reporting system on how well countries are doing in fighting corruption. So we take the best models, we, we, we rate countries, and we use that to help them improve their, their efforts to fight corruption. And that's why Senator Wicker and I have filed legislation that would provide resources to the State Department to deal with anti-corruption efforts. The bottom line is we need to stay united because let us be clear, there is no administration, whether it be a, a Democratic or Republican administration that welcomes and encourages congressional involvement in areas that have for too long been handled as uh, diplomatic issues rather than matters involving legislature and policy. We need to stay united in a strong effort to promote U.S. values, global values uh, that are represented by the global Magnitsky statute. So I look forward to working with you as we advance these issues. And Mr. Chairman, I would ask my entire statement be made part of your record. Yeah, without without objection. And I know that um, you're on a, on a on a tight time schedule here, so I'm not going to uh, prolong this with many questions, but I, you know, you are the the chair of the uh, the Helsinki uh, commission, uh, uh, commissioner of the, uh, the Helsinki Commission, and um, you know was wondering whether or not uh, you know multilateral Magnitsky action would be a priority for some of the work that you're doing in in the commission. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it, it, make no mistake about it. This is going to be our priority. I just came from a hearing in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee 
with the Secretary General of the Organization of American States. Uh, Senator Wicker and I, uh, you helped pass this in, uh, in the last Congress, a parliamentary dimension to the OAS. So it's not just the OSCE and the Helsinki Commission in Europe and Central Asia, but also in our own hemisphere, we believe that the multilateral approach by parliamentarian involvement can make a major di uh, difference in advancing rights such as uh, basic human rights. Well, I appreciate that. And we will continue to work with you and your team on, on as we dr dr draft our version of the Global Magnitsky uh, legislation here in the House. But uh, again, we appreciate the, your incredible dedication to human rights on so many fronts. And um, I know you're uh, you're tight for time, so I'm not going to have any more questions, but I'll yield to uh, Co-Chair Smith if he has any questions or comments. I'll keep it very brief, too. I didn't realize you had to leave. But but thank you, Ben, for, uh, Senator Wick, uh, uh, Cardin, for your extraordinary work. Um, it has been a a real joy to work with you, particularly on the issue of committing anti-Semitism uh, for decades. Uh, you have been a real champion, and I thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned the, the importance of corruption. Uh, I remember, and I, I hope memory serves me correct, uh, in the year 2000, when we were in Bucharest at the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, the whole focus was on corruption uh, as not only uh, a way of undermining democracy, but also human rights. So I think your point was very well taken in your testimony about uh, the linkage to corruption uh, and, and human rights abuse, because it is, they're joined at the end. Uh, we look forward to working with you, Ben. And uh, again, I thank you so much for your leadership. Let me point out the strongest leader on recognizing the connection with corruption and human rights, good governance, dem democratic institutions, et cetera, was the late Senator John McCain. I remember I cherished those conversations we had where he insisted and in, uh, in, in this, this legislation was going through uh, uh, a Department of Defense authorization bill. And he insisted, even though the State Department resisted, including uh, corruption as part of Magnitsky, he insisted that it be included. Of course, we very strongly uh, put it in our legislation. So thank you for mentioning that corruption has now recognized as a real national security concern for America, it really does lead to the loss of democratic states and security concerns to America. Thank you so much, Senator Gordon. Uh, is uh, Ms. Jackson Lee uh, with us? Yes, I am. Uh, do, you, do you have any, any uh, quick questions for Senator Gordon before he leaves? No, just to simply thank you, Senator Cardin. We work together in the United States House, and uh, I thank you for continuing the work that uh, you started there and continuing in the United States Senate. And just to remind you of the issue as we go forward of the terrible impact of human rights violation on women. Uh, and I don't yep. know if you have a comment on that and how we need to uh, further enhance our emphasis on protecting those vulnerable communities. Thank you. Uh, I don't I agree have with a you. comment. I certainly agree with you in regards to women. The best thing the Senate could do is follow the House leadership this past equal rights amendment, but uh, give a little plug on that. But uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I can assure you gender equality is an issue that we're going to be taking up as part of the uh, the sustainable development goals under the United Nations, and it's a priority for the OSCE, no question about it, and for the Helsinki. Very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. And Senator, thank you so much for being here and thank you for your leadership. And we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. You too. Thank you. All right. I'm now going to call up our second panel. Uh, first, uh, Michael Breen, President and Chief Executive Officer of Human Rights First. Uh, before jo joining Human Rights First, uh, Mr. Breen served as President and CEO of the Truman National Security Project, a nationwide membership organization committed to advocating for tough, smart security solutions. He's a U.S. Army veteran. Um, he served in the White House. Uh, he served in the office of the White House Counsel and co-founded uh, the International Refugee Assistance Project, working with refugee families in Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. Uh, Brad Brooks Rubin uh, is General Counsel to the Century, which is an investigative and policy team that follows the dirty money connected to African war criminals and transnational war profiteers and seeks to shut those benefiting from violence out of the international financial system. From 20, uh, to 2009 to 2013, Mr. Brooks Rubin served as Special Advisor for Conflict, uh, Conflict Diamonds at the Department of State prior to joining State. He served as, a, uh, as an Attorney Advisor to the Treasury Department's Office of the Chief Counsel Foreign Assets Control. Beth Van Schock 
is the Lee Kaplan Visiting Professor in Human Rights at Stanford Law School and has been the Acting Director of, of Human Rights and Conflict Resolution, uh, has been the Acting Director of the Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic. She's also a faculty fellow with Stanford Center for Human Rights and International Justice. Prior to returning to academia, she served as the deputy to the ambassador at large for war crimes issues in the Office of the Global of Global Criminal Justice of the U.S. Department of State under Secretaries Clinton and Kerry, where she advised U.S. policy regarding the prevention, prevention of and accountability for mass atrocities. She also advises a number of human rights and international justice organizations. Tutu Alicante is human rights as a human rights lawyer and sharp-witted commentator on all things authoritarian and kleptocracy. kleptocracy. A native of Equatorial Guinea, he is the founder of EG Justice, the only human rights organization that focuses exclusively, exclusively on this Central African nation. He has written for the Washington Post and the Guardian, and he has led the way in pushing back against authoritarian kleptocracy in his native country. Uh, and John Hughes uh, is an adjunct senior fellow in energy, economics, and security program at the Center for a New American S Security and a senior vice president at Albright Stonebridge Group, where he advises clients on a number of issues, including sanctions. Previously, he was the deputy director in the Office of Sanctions Policy and Implementation in the Department of State's Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. I'm grateful that you are all here, uh, and I would now yield to Mr. Breen for his opening remarks. Thank you, Co-Chair McGovern and Co-Chair Smith, uh, for the opportunity to testify on the Global Magnitsky Sanctions Program on its impact and how it can be strengthened to help counter rising threats to human rights and the rule of law around the world. And Senator Cardin, thank you for your longstanding leadership on these issues. Human Rights First is an independent, nonprofit advocacy organization that for over four decades has urged the United States to take a leading role in promoting and protecting human rights. And this work has never been more urgent as authoritarianism rises and democracy faces a crisis of disillusionment. These challenges require a comprehensive strategy drawing on all the tools of diplomacy and foreign policy. Targeted sanctions like the Global Magnitsky Program are a valuable tool. They can provide a measure of personal accountability to the worst human rights violators and corrupt actors. They can stigmatize foreign officials without ending a bilateral relationship. They can frustrate criminal networks and express solidarity with human rights defenders. And they can ensure that a price is paid for violating international norms and paid by the perpetrators, not the victims. To help make these tools work, Human Rights First built a global network of 250 NGOs that has brought information about sanctionable acts to the U.S. government. Our coalition members fight against religious persecution, attacks on journalists, gender-based violence, mass atrocities, corruption, and other abuses. Since 2017, we've helped submit cases documenting abuses by more than 400 persons including dictators, kleptocrats, security forces, militias, and more. And of the 250 individuals and entities in 34 countries that the United States has sanctioned, more than one third had a basis in recommendations from our coalition. Sanctions are not a panacea, and their impact is difficult to measure. Their selective use risks sending the wrong message, that accountability bends to power, as we cautioned when the U.S. failed to designate all those responsible for the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. But without the Global Magnitsky Program, it is unlikely any of the 19 Saudi persons sanctioned for Mr. Khashoggi's death would have faced serious consequences. Today, I want to highlight four ways Global Magnitsky sanctions contribute to an effective foreign policy. First, these sanctions can show support for national accountability efforts, ranging from the Gambia's efforts to investigate abuses and assets linked to its former president, to South Africa's investigation of state capture by members of an influential family. In Latvia, U.S. sanctions against a corrupt official spurred national authorities to end his control over major ports days later. Second, Global Magnitsky sanctions can enable the U.S. and its partners to respond more precisely and forcefully to grave international crimes. Just this week, the EU, U.K., and Canada joined the United States in imposing sanctions on specific officials and entities complicit in abuses against minorities in Xinjiang. This was the first time all four issued coordinated global Magnitsky sanctions, a multilateral effort with the potential for even greater impact. Third, these sanctions help hinder corrupt schemes with serious implications for good governance and environmental protections, from illegal logging in Cambodia to 
corrupt mining and oil deals in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And fourth, global Magnitsky sanctions can signal solidarity with marginalized or vulnerable groups, such as politically active women who were arbitrarily detained and raped in Yemen, and LGBTQI persons who were kidnapped, tortured, and killed in Chechnya. The sanctions program exists because of Congress's broad bipartisan support for combating corruption and human rights abuses. We encourage Congress to again express that support by permanently reauthorizing the Global Magnitsky Act with the following updates. First, Congress should codify the beneficial aspects of the 2017 executive order that broadened the program's scope. This includes protecting all victims equally, covering non-state actors and single incidents of abuse, and allowing status-based targeting so leaders cannot wash their hands of subordinates abuses. Second, Congress should allow for sanctions against immediate family members of sanctions targets, who often help hide assets or benefit from ill-gotten gains. Third, Congress should call on the administration to expand its coordination with civil society and foreign governments on global Magnitsky sanctions to more effectively isolate bad actors. And finally, we encourage Congress to build on its consistent support for funding the agencies that implement the Global Magnitsky program. I'll conclude by sharing what Global Magnitsky sanctions mean for our coalition members. After the U.S. sanctioned an oligarch in Central Asia for corruption, a local NGO told us it was, quote, a real game changer for the whole region. It showed kleptocrats that impunity was no longer a given, and it galvanized local civil society, bringing hope that accountability is possible for the abuses they have so long fought. On behalf of the brave people we work with who are engaged in this fight, thank you for your commitment to combating corruption and human rights abuses. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Breen. I now will turn it over to Brad Brooks Rubin. Co-Chair McGovern, Co-Chair Smith, Representative Jackson Lee, Senator Cardin, esteemed co-panelists and WebEx viewers, it is a privilege to testify today in support of reauthorization of the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act, and I thank the Commission for the invitation. In his day, the late great Nigerian musician and Afrobeat innovator Bella Kuti was, among many other things, an anti-corruption and human rights activist. Not unlike Sergei Magnitsky, Fela fought back against corruption and suffered terribly at the hands of the state. And now, decades after Fela was decried international peace thief, Fela's son Femi is singing on a new album that, quote, you can't fight corruption with corruption. Too often, the United States and its allies have fought corruption in such contradictory and counterproductive ways, allowing problems to fester and metastasize. In recent years, though, thanks to the work of this, committee, this commission and others, the international community and the United States have advanced in this fight. Global Magnitsky, or GLOMAG, represents one of the most important tools. And to be clear, GLOMAG is a tool, not a policy or a strategy in itself in the global fight against corruption and human rights abuse. As I will lay out in my testimony here today and more fully in writing, GLOMAG is at the center of two foreign policy successes, and it is the consistent use of network-focused GLOMAG sanctions in conjunction with other foreign policy tools serving broader policies that have been key to this progress. The first case is South Sudan, where by late 2017, the conflict had reached devastating levels. While many in the international community nodded to the fact that corruption was at the center of ongoing atrocities, little had been done. In September 2017, that began to change. First, with use of the South Sudan sanctions program and an advisory from the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, followed by GLOMAG designations against financier Benjamin Balmel and some of his companies in December 2017, Later, with action by Commerce, a visit by then Treasury Undersecretary Segal Mandelker to the region, and a series of four more GLOMAG designations, the U.S. government imposed pressure on key actors and sectors that contributed to a diplomatic process leading to the formation of a unity government. Although the conflict's root causes have yet to be addressed, full-scale war has not resumed, and part of that is because, for the first time, the country's leaders are experiencing consequences for their destructive actions, thanks in large part to Global Magnitsky. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, by 2016, there was significant fear that then-President Joseph Kabila 
would change the constitution to run for a third term. Though Kabila's reign had been marked by massive corruption and pervasive human rights abuse, little had been done there either. Beginning in mid-2016 and continuing through 2017, the US government, EU, and others began to exert pressure using the DRC sanctions program, visa bans, and engagement by senior US government officials, the message started to be delivered. Then in December 2017, the strongest action to date was taken when longtime Kabila financier and enabler Dan Gertler, as well as his business partner and numerous companies in their network were sanctioned under GLOMAG. In June 2018, GLOMAG was used again against Gertler companies and he featured in a FinCEN advisory about corrupt enablers of human rights abuses. In the end, Kabila did not change the constitution. He did not run in December 2018, and his handpicked successor was trounced in the election. Recently, when Gertler was able to secure an unprecedented OFAC license, there was fear in the DRC and around the world that these gains would be lost. Although the license caused damage, its revocation by the Biden administration following strong bipartisan pressure from Congress and concerted civil society effort was an important correction and more follow-up is needed. And indeed, Gertler's all-out push against the GLOMAG sanctions helped to show us all just how effective as well as how precarious they can be. From these cases, we can glean a few key reasons why GLOMAG has been so effective. Specifically, GLOMAG sanctions in South Sudan and the DRC targeted networks there were multiple follow-up designations in each case, and the sanctions were just one tool of many used, with GLOMAG playing a role that other tools could not. In addition to these case-specific takeaways, there are several other notable elements to global magnitude. Support to whistleblowers and human rights defenders. The recent outrageous death sentence handed down in the DRC to whistleblowers providing information about Dan Gertler and his companies only reinforces how important GLOMAG has been to enabling this inspiring work. The multi-stakeholderization of designation. The coalition led by Human Rights First and Freedom House is a unique innovation, as Representative McGovern noted, rooted in what Congress provided for in the statute, and both organizations deserve credit for their leadership as do Treasury and State. We at the Century have been grateful for the response and attention from Treasury and State when we have submitted dossiers and seen them lead to action. Enabling other tools. Although sanctions should not simply be a form of de facto accountability, they're used to directly target networks of bad actors enables more effective due diligence by banks and the stronger development of responsible business practices overall. There do remain improvements to be made to the GLOMAG program and broader effort, and we hope this hearing and broader reauthorization process as well as continued strong congressional oversight by the Santos Commission and others will bring those to bear, including the initiation of more civil penalty enforcement cases by OFAC and the adoption of an increased funding stream for implementation at Treasury and State. Fela's son Femi has another song on his recent album called, called quote, As We Struggle Every Day, in which he sings that, as we struggle every day, we try to find a better way. The success of GLOMAG and the need for its reauthorization is a testament to the struggle and hard work of thousands of civil society activists around the world, working closely and carefully with congressional leaders and staff, as well as with Treasury and state, and as we have heard, with governments now around the world. We have a long way to go still in the fight against corruption and human rights abuse, but reauthorizing GLOMAG will be one clear step Congress can take to help us all find a better way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Van Schock. Good morning, everyone. Co-Chair McGovern, Co-Chair Smith, distinguished members of the panel, uh, Senator Cardin, uh, Congresswoman Jackson Lee. It's really honored guest. It's really a pleasure to be invited back here to discuss the reauthorization of the Global Magnitsky Act with this um, wonderful panel. My engagement with these issues began actually in 2012 and 13 when I served in the State Department's Office of Global Criminal Justice. During the implementation of President Obama's Atrocities Prevention and Response Initiative, I was part of an interagency group that was actually attempting to draft an executive order that would contain a sort of a global Magnitsky style um, human rights sanctions regime for individuals who foment, perpetrate, or enable mass violence against civilians. And the goal was to create a regime that was separate from a country designation, which as we know, can be politically difficult. 
Um, at the time, the Department of the Treasury representatives were somewhat reticent of this initiative. They very much understood the value of using sanctions to respond to human rights abuses, but they didn't want to create um, expectations that they couldn't meet among civil society, in particular victim and survivors groups. And they were also concerned that many warlords and human rights perpetrators don't travel internationally or participate in international financial systems. And so they were concerned that such, such designations might be purely symbolic in impact. In um, response, however, supporters argued that sanctions actually serve a range of critical purposes, some of which have already been discussed this morning. Um, this includes naming, blaming, and shaming perpetrators so they cannot enjoy the privilege of anonymity, isolating and containing perpetrators and abusers so they cannot travel or profit off of their depredations, restricting access to resources for self-enrichment or to organize abuses, signaling that certain conduct is worthy of censure and expressing solidarity with victims and survivors. It was also suggested during this sort of intra-agency negotiation process that civil society and other actors could be better harnessed to assist in the process of creating designation packages so all of the burden didn't follow, fall on Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control personnel. In the end, as you know, the executive order never materialized and instead Congress um, enacted the groundbreaking Global Magnitsky Act. The architects of this legislation were quite astute in directing the president to consider the views of key members of Congress and committees and also credible information received from non-governmental organizations. Now, later, President Trump issued Executive Order 13818 to implement and ultimately expand on this framework. And this EO is broader than Global Magnitsky in a number of important respects. And I actually really appreciate Senator Cardin's ideas about trying to better align these two authorities so we're not dealing with separate authorities um, and so that we have one authority that covers the field here. The executive order was formulated on what's reformulated the grounds on which individuals or entities could be sanctioned, while GLOMAG covers gross violations of internationally recognized human rights, which is grounded in statute, as um, Senator Smith noted, whereas the executive order speaks of serious human rights abuses. I'm sensitive to the concern that that might be too amorphous, but I think there are ways that we could draft the statute that would cabin this to ensure that we cover non-state actors and not just state actors, while violations and abuses seem to be synonymous to an international lawyer, they actually mean quite different things. Um, violations are used to discuss violations by state actors. These are, and these are agents of the state that bear international human rights obligations by virtue of treaties that the state has ratified or customary international law. By contrast, the concept of abuses is much broader and can cover the conduct of non-state actors who are not acting on behalf of or with the acquiescence of a state. Um, in GLOMAG, the conduct in question is defined to include torture, disappearances, and other flagrant human rights abuses in a sister statute. So there's a nice grounding within the law. The reference to serious human rights abuses is potentially more capacious, but what I like about it is that it more readily covers, for example, acts of sexual violence as raised by Congresswoman Jackson Lee or other nonviolent human rights abuses, such as persecution on the basis of race or religion. The singular use of abuse rather than um, violations also suggests that it's not necessary to show a pattern or practice of harm. Whereas GLOMAG is devoted to protecting human rights advocates and whistleblowers, the executive order is, I think, quite helpful in that it allows for sanctions to be imposed regardless of the nature or status of the victim class. As such, harm to ordinary folks falls within the reach so long as the person to be sanctioned is responsible either directly or indirectly for the harm or is somehow complicit in the harm. We can also reach individuals who are leaders or officials of an entity that has engaged in human rights abuses. So it's not necessary to show that they were directly involved if their organization was involved. We can also use the executive order to reach individuals who've materially assisted, sponsored, or provided other forms of support. And getting at these enablers beyond the individual perpetrator, I think is incredibly important and would help put the pressure on um, or entities and organizations like lawyers and accountants that are assisting with these corrupt and abusive actions. I lead Stanford's human rights hands-on program, and we're a part of the wonderful coalition that Human Rights First and others have convened. As part of this coalition, my students have researched human rights abuses and corruption in Sri Lanka, Guatemala, El Salvador, the Gambia, the Kurdish region of Turkey, the Xinjiang region of China, Iraq, Thailand, and the Philippines. 
We've also shared this research in addition to our coalition partners with in um, new forms with the Department of Justice, Human Rights and Special Prosecution Center, with the Human Rights Violators and War Crimes Center, the sort of fusion center within our law enforcement, and also with the State Department so that it can help populate the consular lookout and support system to ensure that the US doesn't offer safe haven or even a vacation venue for human rights perpetrators. In some cases, we stayed within the confines of, of GLOMAG. So, for example, we researched attacks on journalists in Sri, Lankers, in Sri Lanka or on protesters during the 2019 uprising in Iraq. But in many other cases, the information that we were seeing and that we were collecting was more responsive to the executive order because it involved human rights abuses committed against ordinary civilians and their communities. Acts that many would deem are deserving of sanction, but they were not necessarily targeted to individuals who were seeking to expose illegal activity or to defend international human rights. Indeed, many of my students were quite confused about the distinction between GLOMAG and EO and queried why we would use GLOMAG if we have a broader authority within the executive order. So given the success of GLOMAG as revealed by the testimony of my colleagues here and also the fact that it's been picked up by so many of our friends and allies around the world, it's obvious I think that reauthorization and, and a permanent reauthorization is warranted. If Congress is inclined to think about ways to expand and strengthen GLOMAG, I'd love to um, offer some suggestions. And in this regard, I, I heartily support the amendments being proposed by Senator Cardin and others in S-93. So first, um, better aligning GLOMAG with the executive order and particularly removing the category or status of abuse of victims. It would be quite easy just to eliminate the language in section 1263, big A and big B, um, to ensure that the, the sanctions regime is um, able to be used against harm committed against ordinary persons. I think it's important to keep this in place if for whatever reason the executive order is lifted, we know they're more transient than a statutory basis. I also understand that one of the biggest challenges to taking full advantage of GLOMAG is the lack of sufficient resources to undertake the considerable work within the State Department and Treasury to prepare these designation packages, notwithstanding the outside research being um, provided by coalition members and, and members of Congress and, and congressional um, committees. I understand it takes about six to nine months to put together uh, a package and a lot of mischief can be can be carried out during that period. And so in the absence of human power, it would be great to get um, you end up having these backlogs where bad actors are able to act with impunity and particularly from low priority countries that may not get the attention they need. This furthers the appearance of selective implementation, which ends up being a perennial criticism of these sanctions regime. I would also love to see greater transparency around the internal deliberative process, why certain individuals were included and why certain individuals were not included. Mm -hmm. This lack of communication makes it hard for those of us on the outside to do good work and to understand where the priorities are within government. I recently participated in two fora involving victims from Sri Lanka on the one hand and in the other event, victims from the Xinjiang region, all were deeply, deeply grateful for the sanctions that have been issued and were well aware of them. Everyone talks about these sanctions. They're making a big impact on the ground. But there were also lots of questions about why particular individuals had not been included within these programs. Um, it would also be helpful, I think, for the U.S. government to articulate the nature of the behavioral changes that are expected to justify delisting an individual or entity. These are meant to be a tool, a lever, and so it should be clear to individuals that are included within these programs what they need to do in order to get themselves removed in terms of better, off, better benchmarks, et cetera. So there's a sense of a sort of off-ramp available. Um, as mentioned by Senator Cardin, of course, Congress should continue to encourage outreach to other nations to further multilateralize these sanctions as has been called for by many consortia. This will only expand their reach and magnify their impact. We also need to look for ways to build capacity around the globe to actually enforce these sanctions vis-a-vis -vis potential perpetrators, particularly in areas with weak regulatory environments. Um, Second, my penultimate suggestion um, is that particularly with respect to legal entities, the U.S. can better coordinate our sanctions with our anti-trafficking authorities. This would involve coordinating sanctions with trade restrictions, supply chain curtailment, et cetera, if these entities are that are associated with human rights abuses include um, forced labor and other forms of trafficking. Um, 
Although we think about these as behavioral modification tools, as I've mentioned, a lot of work goes into these packages that could be repurposed to support accountability efforts, either in the domestic system from where, which these individuals hail or within our own courts. These tools are not mutually exclusive and there may be sanctioned individuals who could be prosecuted criminally under our own International Crime Institute. And in this regard, I'm really hopeful that Congress this term will take up and give serious consideration to the idea of a crimes against humanity statute to try and plug some of these gaps. In the same vein, I'd love to see some of these assets that have been frozen and rendered inert potentially repurposed to assist in the rehabilitation of, um, of survivors and victims. This is being considered in Canada and elsewhere. This could involve greater coordination with the Department of Justice, who can initiate criminal and civil forfeiture of assets um, proceedings that are sufficiently connected to individuals. This was exemplified in the Gambia, where the former president of the Gambia was sanctioned in 2017, and then in July 2020, you at the U.S. Attorney's Office filed a civil MREM action against his mansion in Maryland, actually, um, in Senator Cardin's state. So uh, obviously, I make these recommendations cognizant of the fact that these are so not necessarily always considered accountability tools, but I think there's ways that we could better work um, together in order to strengthen both of these um, accountability options. I'd love to thank um, Senator Cardin for his leadership in this area and others who are concerned about these things. Echo the testimony of my co-panelists that human rights and anti-corruption sanctions must be part of a broader strategy to protect and promote international human rights and to curtail corruption around the globe. And this should involve embedding sanctions within a larger strategy to address these depredations, including civil and criminal accountability and the rehabilitation of victims. So thanks very much for your consideration of these ideas, and I really look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Ali Kante. Thank you, Co-Chair McGovern, Co-Chair Smith, and Representative uh, Jackson Lee for the invitation to testify about the effectiveness of the Global Magnitsky Act. I direct EG Justice, a human rights NGO focused on my country, Equatorial Guinea, a Central African nation controlled by the longest ruling head of state in the world. Characterized by its intense repression and endemic corruption, Equatorial Guinea gained attention earlier this month, I'm sure you might have heard about it, following the deadly series of explosions caused by the government's reckless disregard for civilian life. Equatorial Guinea ranks among the worst of the worst for its human rights record, measures of corruption and transparency, alongside North Korea and Turkmenistan. President Teodoro Obiang is an authoritarian despot who took power in a military coup in 1979. In, two, in 2012, he made his son, Teodoro Ngema, known as Teodorin, vice president, in charge of the highly repressive security forces. The judiciary is completely under presidential control. There is no rule of law. Journalists undergo extreme censorship. My country is a textbook case for a complete state capture. Former president of Gambia, Yaya Jame, who Professor Van Schaak referred to, is now enjoying retirement sheltered by the president of Equatorial Guinea in Equatorial Guinea. I cannot return home, however, where my family, including my ailing mother, still resides because the president has labeled me a traitor enemy of the state. In the early 1990s, U.S. companies discovered oil in Equatorial Guinea. Billions of dollars in oil revenue soon transformed it from an impoverished country to the Kuwait of Africa, where the continent's highest GDP per capita. Yet that wealth is concentrated exclusively in the hands of the president's family and associates. In 2004, a Senate investigation found that DC-based Riggs Bank managed over 60 accounts controlled by President Obiang with a balance of $700 million. It also found that at least $35 million were transferred to offshore shell companies controlled by President Obiang. In 2010, a separate 
Senate investigation entitled Keeping Foreign Corruption Out of the United States found that the son of the president, Theodorin, assisted by US lawyers, real estate agents, and escrow agents, illegally moved more than $110 million in potentially illicit funds into the US. I attended that hearing. It was, in fact, my very first time in Congress. And I watched baffled as lawyers and real estate agents summoned to testify about their role in enabling hundreds of millions of dollars to flow in and purchase assets in the US in violation of banking and anti-money laundering laws, pled the fifth, and walked out of the room unblemished. I realized then that the US should not only fight kleptocracy around the world, but it must act at home. Since then, France, Switzerland, Brazil, and South Africa have found that Theodorin spent, with the help of professional enablers, well over 500 million on his Playboy lifestyle. Corruption is never a victimless crime, but its consequences are especially devastating in my country where endemic corruption and flagrant repression converge with dramatic consequences. Three fourths of the people in my country subsist on less than $2 a day. They struggle to access water, medical care, and education. Over the last year, COVID-19 has deepened the inequality divide, has exacerbated corruption, and has been used to arrest and beat the poor struggling to subsist. US companies, including Exxon, Marathon, and Noble Energy, own almost 22 billion worth of assets in Equatorial Guinea. So consequently, the US has a strategic interest in promoting good governance and helping create a stable operating business climate that secures US investments and reduces the risk of complicity in serious human rights violations. The Obiang family transnational kleptocracy, however, is only possible with the material assistance of unscrupulous lawyers like Michael Berger and George Nagler, who help Theodorin circumvent US laws and launder millions. It is only possible with the material assistance of real estate agents like Neil Badin and John Kerrigan, who facilitated Theodorin's purchase of a $30 million Malibu mansion. The evidence of Theodorin's lavish spending of ill-gotten gains eventually led the US to seize that mansion and other assets. Other governments did the same, yet his enablers have not been touched. So Executive Order 13818 expands the scope of the Global Magnitsky Act to apply sanctions to any person determined to have materially assisted otherwise sanctionable persons and offenses. Western enablers, Western enablers are the fulcrum without whom complex financial crimes could not be carried out. So protecting the gains of Global Magnitsky Act means using it to deter the worst of the worst, authoritarian kleptocrats responsible for endemic corruption, widespread human rights violations, and impunity. Genuine US leadership in combating transnational authoritarian kleptocracy means wielding its powerful tool to deter lawyers and other US enablers from materially assisting kleptocrats and human rights abusers in furthering sanctionable activities. This, Congressman, is your opportunity to act to counter kleptocracy that entrenches corruption and repression. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hughes. Co Chair of the Governor Smith, Senator Cardin, Representative Jackson Lee, and distinguished members of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the role of sanctions as a foreign policy tool and how they can be most effective in the context of the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act, or GLOMAG. I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak on this very important topic and humbled to be part of this illustrious group testifying today. I applaud Congress's work to create this important legislation that provides the U.S. government with a flexible option to use when going after those involved in human rights abuses and corruption, and one that I believe has been a valuable addition to the sanctions toolkit. Given the likelihood of the continued use of this powerful tool in the months and years ahead, my testimony focuses on how best to maximize its impact. This includes five steps. First, sanctions must be part of a broader, clearly defined strategy that takes into account the foreign policy objectives the U.S. government wishes to achieve. In the global context, this should include a clear description, a clear description of the human rights or corruption issues the policy is trying to address and how the use of sanctions will help advance this goal. The strategy should also seek to identify specific benchmarks that are tied to the objectives and detail how sanctions can help meet these benchmarks. Second, once the strategy is developed, policymakers must decide which tools can best achieve the U.S. government's goals. Choosing the right tools requires a sober analysis of the benefits and limitations of the use of sanctions and how their impact can be leveraged by other tools of economic statecraft, diplomacy, foreign aid, and for GLOMAG, existing human rights and corruption focused initiatives, some of which have already been mentioned today. These tools could include, for example, export controls on US technology that could be used for surveillance, supply chain restrictions on imports derived from forced labor, other anti-corruption efforts, diplomatic outreach to relevant governments and other stakeholders, aid to civil society or others working on these issues in country, and any joint efforts with allies. GOMAC currently includes a reporting requirement that compels the executive branch to annually submit a list of sanctions imposed and the reasons for imposing those sanctions. I would suggest expanding this reporting requirement to also include an articulation of how the sanctions imposed fit into this broader foreign policy objective, as well as any additional tools used alongside sanctions to achieve that objective. This can help provide Congress and the public with greater context and understanding to help inform further oversight for their ongoing use. Third, once this framework is established, it is important to decide on which targets to actually sanction. This requires significant coordination across the U.S. government so that it is organized to be able to identify and quickly move on sanctions cases as necessary. To be most effective, such deliberations should ideally include viewpoints, not just from relevant U.S. government agencies, but also from non-governmental sources with expertise and deep experience with the issues. This is why I applaud the requirement in GLOMAG to consider credible information provided by Congress or by other countries and NGOs that monitor violations of human rights when looking at potential sanctions targets. I cannot stress enough the value from the insights and analysis provided by those who spend their careers deeply involved with these issues, often directly with those impacted by the corruption or human rights abuses on the ground. Fourth, sanctions must constantly be evaluated against the state of foreign policy objectives. This should include regular impact assessments, as well as after action reports once sanctions have been lifted. Now, the executive branch has many resources to draw from in order to do these assessments. I believe that civil society and other stakeholders have a critical role here to play as well. Therefore, I would recommend that Congress broaden the consultative requirement in GLOMAG to also include a requirement to formally seek input from civil society on the impact of sanctions already imposed and to require regular reporting on this issue. This would create a consistent opportunity to consider the sanctions effectiveness and whether any course corrections are necessary. I believe this process would be helpful in other sanctions contexts as well. Finally, sanctions are best when done multilaterally. That is why it's very encouraging to see that so many countries have adopted similar legislation in recent months that is modeled on the important work done by Congress under GLOMAG. Recognizing the value of coordination, Congress has already included a requirement in GLOMAG for the executive branch to report on efforts to encourage other governments to impose similar sanctions. Now that these new sanctions regimes are in place with many of our allies, coordination is more important than ever. In closing, when wielded correctly, GLOMAG sanctions can be a powerful tool in the effort to root out corruption and prevent future human rights abuses. By embedding them in a larger effort rooted in U.S. values and policy priorities that draws on input from relevant stakeholders, carefully assesses their impact and effectiveness, and works in concert with allies, we can give them their best chance for success. Thank you for your time and for allowing me to speak on this important topic today, and I look forward to your questions. 
Well, thank you very much. Oh, let me thank all of you. Uh, this was an excellent panel, and um, and I appreciate your recommendations. Uh, let me just say, you know, um, uh, there's no such thing as a perfect piece of legislation. Uh, and, um, you know, the Magnitsky Act and the Global Magnet Magnitsky, um, you know, um, have been, um, you know, I think have, have been in incredibly successful, but that doesn't mean that we can't build on it and that we can't make it uh, even better. Um, and, you know, and I am, you know, having co-chaired this commission now for several years with my colleague, Mr. Smith, I mean, one of the things that I always am concerned about is making sure that, um, you know, that when we talk about human rights and then we talk about human rights or corruption sanctions in particular, that, it, you know, that we, that we, that we're consistent uh, in its application, that we're not, you know, focused on country X because, you know, we have an adversarial relationship with them, but uh, country Y, we turn a blind eye because, well, it's inconvenient or uncomfortable. Um, and so I, you know, I, I feel that, you know, in all of our human rights policy, and it's, that there needs to be a level of consistency. But many of you mentioned that uh, Globe, Globe Mag sanctions are best seen as one tool in the toolbox to be used together with other tools that the U.S. has at its disposal, and that action should be coordinated with other countries. Uh, you know, these are important points, and I agree with you completely uh, on, on those points. The U.S. should be as purposeful and strategic as possible in its targeted uh, sanctions policy. Several of you have said that you hope Congress will support dedicated funding for GLOMAG enforcement. And I want you to know that uh, we plan on doing that, uh, making sure that the resources are available. Um, and I think uh, you can be assured that that will, will happen. Uh, several of you mentioned that you have worked closely with Freedom House, uh, and you complimented their work, especially uh, with the with the coalition of organizations that's been developing cases. I also very much appreciate their work, and I look forward to receiving the, the statement that they will be submitting for the record. Uh, and I'm truly struck by how much of the success of uh, GLOMAG has has depended on the action of civil society organizations, and I'm grateful. Uh, to you for highlighting this aspect. And I, I just get two questions and whoever or everybody, whoever wants to answer these just briefly, I just, uh, you know, does the work of building cases for sanctions entail risks for civil society organizations? And how can we in Congress best support civil society in their work? Whoever wants to. I, I'm happy to. I'm happy to start. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for your comments, and, and again, thank you for the question and and, uh, and the support um, that this law provides the civil society. In some way, it's very true that doing this work involves risks. Um, uh, but I think you know, in some ways, the most important thing that can be done is to is to have an outlet like Glomag that shows that civil society organizations taking those risks can see their work lead to something. I think that's the um, the most important motivation and the most important kind of encouragement that can be provided is when, when you know, we as a, uh, a US-based organization, but with many colleagues overseas and with an organization like Tutus, uh, which is sort of balanced, you know, which is focused in, in a different region, to be able to demonstrate to colleagues in that affected country or in another country that Congress is listening, that the U.S. government is listening, and that other governments, our allies, are also listening. Uh, there is, to, to my experience, nothing more motivating and more powerful than that. And, and I think Tutu's comments were, were exactly a testament to that. I think providing continue, you know, stronger whistleblower support uh, overall, uh, you know, funding through the State Department and others for whistleblowers to protect human rights defenders. Um, is really important. I, I mentioned in my testimony the case of two whistleblowers who provided information about Dan Gertler that demonstrated the level of his corruption. In the DRC, they were quickly sentenced to death, and, and that's, uh, you know, engaging, uh, ensuring that the State Department is following up on cases like that, and again, that there are resources available 
um, to support the work of whistleblowers in civil society is really essential. But, but in the end, reauthorizing this bill and continuing to strongly support it is, uh, is among the most important things that can be done. Uh, Congressman, maybe I could just add two points to, I think, with Brad's uh, eloquent comments there. I mean, the first, and I mentioned this in my statement, I, I really, having built sanctions packages in the past uh, in many different countries, it really does take a lot of work and a lot of effort. And I, I really I really mean it when I say that civil society plays a really, really important role here. And I think some of the information that they can provide is really, we would not be able to sanction some of these people without it. And so I think it is essential that they're involved and they really, despite all the resources that the US government, I mean, the civil society just has a different perspective and they're often able to bring information that isn't otherwise available. So that, that's the first point. The second point is on, making sure that the information is used. Now, as, as you rightfully said, there are reasons sometimes where the U.S. government decides not to sanction somebody or, you know, they have certain priorities or, or, or whatever. I think it's really, really important that they're clear on what those reasons are. And this is why I recommend that there is sort of a two-way street here where they are sort of in constant dialogue with civil society, taking into account their considerations, but also, you know, letting them know uh, when they may not be moving forward with a sanctions package and also letting Congress uh, and the public know. I just think that being very clear on, on these reasons is really important. And, you know, obviously some of the information can't be shared, but the more that we can do that and make sort of an, an environment that is uh, permissive in that regard, I think the better. I may add, uh, Congressman, this is the third time I'm testifying in front of uh, Congress. Uh, the very first time I did, in fact, I submitted my comments and I had someone else read it, and that's because I didn't feel comfortable or protected to do so. Uh, since then, the support of civil society in the U.S. and the support of U.S. lawmakers have allowed me to come forward. Every single human rights activist in Equatorial Guinea that has worked with me, Alfredo Kenve, Joaquin Eloayeto, Ramon uh, Esono Ebale, all, all people they have been tortured, they've been put in jail. And thanks to people like Senator Durbin and, and Congresswoman uh, Karen Bass, we've been able to advocate on behalf of these people and get them out of jail. So without a doubt, this entails serious risk for people engaging in this work and, on, on the ground. However, kleptocrats thrives when there is silence, when they are ignored. So the global Magnitsky pierces through that silence. Is a way to tell kleptocrats, and so so does so does the the Khashoggi uh, uh, sanctions. Is a way to tell kleptocrats that we will be watching you, and if you go after journalists, if you go after human rights activists, if you go after an anti-corruption activists, we will sanction you. I would I would echo everything that um, my fellow panelists have said, and, and especially echo the critical role that members of Congress can play. Um, many of our partners in, in the coalition, especially our partners on the ground, um, face the same challenges that Mr. Alcante has faced, um, where it's risky for them to step forward and to speak out. Um, members of Congress can be that champion when they are. Uh, that gives voice to the cause, and that, that shines the light that needs to be shown. Um, so making use of your platform in your office to support human rights defenders, as, as so many of you have done on this commission, that is absolutely essential, and that, that's one of the things our partners on the ground ask us for most frequently. Um, um, Ms. Franchard, do you want to add anything? or? Um... No, just to say, you know, when my students do this work, we're obviously sitting quite comfortably in Silicon Valley, and so most of our work has been through open sources. Um, but we still uh, anonymize accounts, et cetera, for protection. But we also do reach out to groups and organizations in the field, and so there's a very strong role that organizations based here that are um, safe from some of the threats that individuals on the ground face can do to filter information that comes from the field so that it's it has some ground truth to it and it's not just relying on open source information. So that's really the brilliance of the Freedom House Human Rights First Coalition okay. is to bring these groups together. Yeah. Let me just go through a series of questions here pretty quickly. Mr. Breen, you know, you cite that the Khashoggi case is an example of the problem that selective application of sanctions risks sending the message that accountability bends to power. Um, do you have any recommendations for the problem of selective ap application beyond encouraging everybody to continue pressuring U.S. officials? Um, are you aware of cases where political pressure reversed the decision not to sanction? Well, I appreciate the question. Um, you know, I think, I think the, 
the transparency and, and feedback to civil society on the reasons um, when, when the United States declines to sanction, that point is, is very important. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say that, you know, we, we believe that, and, and we could go through a long list, but we believe that global right. banking designations would likely be appropriate to help address conditions in countries that include Azerbaijan, Bahrain, mm -hmm. Egypt, the Philippines, the UAE, Vietnam, Equatorial Guinea, for example, and the list goes on. Um, and that's not to say that that global banking is, key, is the only uh, thing that can be used, the only program that can or should be used to address these issues, uh, but it is essential. Um, and so I think that you know, essen essentially, the the need for transparency is great. The need for accountability and the use of the tool is great. Um, we've submitted fairly extensive recommendations to the executive branch on on which I submitted along with my testimony in a document called Walking the Talk. Um, on how they should approach uh, the use of this tool and other tools. Um, but yes, civil society does have a major role to play in ensuring mm -hmm. that the tool is used appropriately and without that selectivity and transparency on the reasons uh, for the decisions that, that the government makes, whether to sanction or not, is a key component of our ability to do that. Mr. Mr. Brooks Rubin, based on your testimony, would it be, would it be correct um, to say um, that improve follow-up and messaging around delistings could increase the capacity of GLOMAG sanctions to leverage changes in, in behavior? Thank you, Con uh, Representative McGovern. Yes, I, I think that's true. I think um, one, uh, you know, OFAC, uh, and, I, and I say this as a proud alum of the Treasury Department, you know, OFAC has a lot on its plate and delistings uh, are often one of those elements that don't get enough attention uh, because there is priority on, you know, new sanctions and new actions. And I think it is essential when you are, you know, the points that, that, that John and others have made today, it is essential that when you are being uh, clear about what your policy is, that you give the opportunity for those actors who have been sanctioned to demonstrate a change in behavior uh, to help contribute to the policy. If sanctions are viewed as essentially a permanent fixture, uh, then you really do, you haven't created a tool that can yeah. enable uh, a change in behavior. I think, you know, our concern when the Dan Gertler license was issued was that he hasn't demonstrated a change in behavior despite some, you know, empty rhetoric on that front. Um, but, when, you know, when there is a change in behavior and when the policy can be clearly articulated that way, OFAC should be directed to ensure that delistings are quick. You know, when you had a fully, you know, when you have fully integrated policies where things are really working, OFAC is able to do those things. And I think it is clear that um, more attention is needed. And, and as you also said, messaging. I think the point about requiring additional reporting um, and really integrating the diplomacy with the sanctions is, is what is critical. And, you know, in, in sanctions programs that work well, the actions, uh, both designations, delistings, and as I mentioned in my testimony, hopefully more enforcement cases to, to penalize actors who are dealing with designated targets, uh, reinforcing that messaging throughout, that's how you achieve your policy goals. And I think yeah. the more of that we can see, the better. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Van Schaak, you recommend greater transparency around the internal deliberative process that leads to sanctioned designations. So based on your own experiences uh, at state, at state what are the obstacles to achieving this? And are there reasons the executive branch would prefer less transparency? Uh, and if so, do you see a role for Congress in addressing their concerns? Thanks for the question. I think we've touched on it a little bit with this idea of some more robust reporting around the sanctions regimes, who's in, who's out, why are they in, and how does it fit within a larger strategy? I think that would help those of us out here in the field that are trying to feed information in and be helpful to make GLOMAG as powerful as it can be. Um, and it also will help, I think, individuals on the ground who see the selective enforcement as problematic. They don't understand why somebody is and somebody is not. And so greater reporting, I think, would be helpful, greater articulation of the policy, and improving these ideas of off ramps. I do want to say, I think there will be some individuals who will not be amenable to behavioral change. And that's where I would then recommend we look to other tools that we might have in the accountability toolbox and thinking about civil forfeiture, et cetera. And that then would make clear that, um, you know, your behavior has not changed and it's unlikely to change or or the the crimes that you are addressed you have been accused or alleged to have been committed are so serious that we can't simply
really allow you to be delisted just because you start giving money to right. Greenpeace or something. Right. But what what, what about the internal? Um, I mean, look. I mean, I I've worked with all kinds of administrations, Democratic and Republican administrations, various state departments. I mean, I mean, I, you know, sometimes there's a they don't want to be transparent. <laughs> um, and I mean, is it, you know, and I think uh, you know if there's kind of selective implementation of some of these sanctions i mean i i, I mean I, how hard is it do you think to kind of will it be to get them to you know agree to just to be more forthright and more clear on on you know why this person and not that person and why you know yeah uh, maybe yeah. it involves political considerations or strategic who who knows but i mean um but i think that's that that's a you know people off, often ask well we we appreciate this but you know Here's here's some people in this country that quite frankly should you know should be on this list, but yet you know the U.S. is taking no action there. Um, so how how do we deal with that? Yeah, you'll remember in the early days of GLOMAG, actually the Obama administration was quite slow on the uptick, and I think there was some grumbling out of Congress on this. Of course, there are a whole host of different equities that come to bear on whether or not to move forward with a set of sanctions. There may be situations that the intelligence community or the State Department have particularized information that suggests that sanctions would not be useful at a particular moment in time. And so maybe it's an option of rather than some sort of a public hearing, but maybe a quiet briefing that members of Congress could participate in with the State Department and the interagency process, the National Security Council, et cetera, to better understand what they're thinking is and why they might choose to move forward on one set of designations and not others. Um, so then you have a better understanding of, okay, this yeah. is part of a larger strategy and we have a very particularized reason to hold off at this moment in time. We may come back to it, there may, circumstances may change. We may be trying to work a different lever. If that lever doesn't work, then we know we have sanctions that we can rely on. And so maybe doing something in a more quiet way would flush out some of the, the thinking that's going into these decisions ultimately. One, and here's the good news. One of the, the good things is that once first the Magnitsky Act became law and then global Magnitsky, I think the Obama administration and, you know, and the Trump administration we have worked with as well has has, has implemented them, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes not as much as we would like. But I will tell you when this, when the original Magnitsky Act was being uh, discussed um, in the House and Senate, there were, there were some people in the Obama administration that really were not excited about us passing this this legislation. Um, Mr. Alicanti, you lay out a strong case that the professional enablers who help their clients uh, evade sanctions should be subject to sanctions themselves. But I can imagine an argument in response that says that the, um, the lawyers and accountants you describe are doing their jobs for their clients. Is enhancing a GLOMAG the best way to get at this problem? Uh, there are other existing tools that could be better used, such as the OFAC penalty uh, authority that is that has that has already been mentioned, or are more tools needed? Thank you very much uh, for that question. So yes, there are the tools that can be used. Um, clearly, uh, self-regulation here have not worked. Lawyers, ethical codes have not worked to stop them from engaging in what. According to the Senate report itself, was clear violation of U.S. banking and anti-money laundering laws. When a bank account was closed, these lawyers were willing to open trust accounts in their own names or use uh, IOLTA accounts to wire in money from a known kleptocrat in Equatorial Guinea. There is no doubt in my mind that they knew what, exactly what they was doing. Right. So I, th I think, yes, uh, uh, the other tools are there. I think the uh, the advantage of GLOMAG is that uh, mm. it lets many of these lawyers know that what I'm doing here can subject me to serious sanctions. And I think uh, here is an example, a perfect example, where all the tools that we have at our disposal can be brought to bear to hold uh, these enablers accountable. Thank you. I just one, one final question, and then I'll turn over to Mr. Smith. And Mr. Hughes, you know, I appreciate your emphasis on evaluating the impact of sanctions and the recommendation for a requirement to involve civil society in the process. But based on your experience, could you say more about um, any obstacles to evaluation that may exist? Would a requirement uh, to evaluate be welcomed, or would it be, or would it meet resistance? And 
realistically, what kind of resources would be needed to carry out the kind of evaluation that you're recommend you're recommending? Well, thank you, Congressman, for the question, and and I think it's a good one. I mean, I think candidly, it, it is very hard to measure uh, the effectiveness and, and impact of sanctions. It's it's often hard to differentiate them between other efforts that are being undertaken, you know, efforts on behalf of the host government, for example, that are sort of mismanaging their own economy. You know, there's lots of different reasons that come into play. It's really hard to isolate sanctions themselves. All that said, it doesn't mean we shouldn't try, right? I mean, I think it is, you know, there are steps you can take to look at impact. You can look at the change in behavior of the individuals targeted. You can look at, you know, potentially the lessening of uh, repercussions for people around them. You can look at you know, actions that are taken maybe by their by their cronies that may be moving away from them, uh, et cetera. And so in each case, it's different. And I think that the, the executive branch will need to define how to do that. Uh, and, and I do take the point, it, it certainly does take resources. On that, I would make two points. This is, again, where civil society comes in. I mean, I think we sh can and should leverage their good work who uh, they're already looking at all this. I can guarantee you they already will be able to do a lot of sort of looking at the impacts because they're involved in it every day and so leverage their abilities. I do think it probably means, you know, more resources uh, for the US government itself. Uh, I would argue that that is true for sanctions across the board. Uh, but that said, I mean, in, in my candid view and having done this for, for a long time, I think that they can shift some of the resources that they already have that are focused on targeting uh, and move on towards impact, right? We don't need to be uh, imposing, you know, many sanctions all the time. I think we should look at which ones are effective and which ones aren't, uh, and also take some of those resources and put it towards towards impact. Uh, and so I think it's by putting the requirement on, you know, to directly answer your question, I think the executive branch may not like it, but I think it will force them to think through uh, whether they work or not and whether they should continue. I know that the Biden administration right now is actually uh, looking at sanctions across the board uh, and looking at whether they're effective, whether they need to make any any changes. And so I think it's a good time to do it. Uh, and I think that, you know, because something is hard, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. Right. Thank you. Again, I want to thank I want to thank everybody here. Um, you know, look, I um, you know, I've been a co-chair of this commission um with Mr. Smith for many years. And um and we hear some of the most horrific stories from uh, human rights defenders, from people who are targeted for persecution for, you know, for reasons that have nothing to do with anything other than them being themselves. And, um, you know, and, and oftentimes we've heard from people that, look, um, we want some consequence uh, imposed, but we don't want a consequence that punishes everybody, uh, especially, you know, the vast majority of a population that may have nothing to do with what these atrocities are all about. And so one of the, the advantages of the Global Magnitsky approach is that they're more targeted um, and we have found that they can be effective because sometimes just across the board blanket sanctions can be pretty cruel uh, to people and we've seen that in country after country and uh, and so I you know I think this is a you know a, a, an important approach it gives us an opportunity you know with regard to I mentioned China before you know to actually um, you know hold those individuals in China who are responsible for some of the horrific policies against the Uyghurs, for example, or the Tibetans, hold them accountable. Um, and it is something that we can do. Uh, but obviously this process needs is, you know, is a work in progress and we need to make it better and more effective uh, so that it has the credibility that we want it to have. Um, and, um, and I, and I, you know, and, and maybe later on you can maybe, I mean, I, 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 we mentioned that other countries are trying to follow suit. You know, not every country is taking the exact language and the exact approach we are. So, you know, that may pose some, you know, challenges, but nonetheless, uh, the idea that this is a movement that is growing, I, I think gives me great hope that, uh, you know, that we'll, we'll, we'll be able to make more progress when it comes to human rights. So with that, I'm happy to uh, turn this over to Co-Chair Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Thank you, Co-Chair. Uh, great panel. Thank you for all for your insights and very incisive uh, testimony. I am uh, just you know, on the issue of selective application, which was brought up uh, just a few moments ago. You know, I've chaired the Human Rights Committee for the Foreign Affairs Committee. I'm now ranking member, um, ranking member on the China Commission. I once chaired it. I also um, I was chairman of the Helsinki Commission. Um, I still serve as the 
Special Representative for Combating Human Trafficking, and also the Lantos Commission. And I've held many hearings, and one of my biggest concerns, and you've all raised it, and I so appreciate it, is this whole idea of selective um, uh, application. And often that starts with a selective fact pattern uh, that is inadequate and done so by design. So I, I you know, since Magnitsky, Global Magnitsky is still, in a way, still in its infancy, uh, we learned lessons from other laws. I wrote the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and I can tell you right from the beginning, uh, the TIP report was far from uh, a, a true representation of what was going on globally. And then we had a major setback during the Obama administration. I'm not being partisan here, but I, I couldn't believe how blatant it was, where more than a dozen countries were falsified in terms of their tier rating. The narrative that precedes the tier rating actually nailed it for Thailand, for China, and for other countries that were then given a, a, a passing grade. And we found uh, Reuters did a, a, a journalist did a, an investigation into this. I raised it at two hearings that I held uh, or chaired on the idea of get it right in the tip report, whether it be friend or foe. If a woman's being so egregiously violated by human traffickers or men uh, by sex or labor trafficking, uh, they don't care if it's a right wing, left wing, or some, some government that is close to the United States. Uh, they are concerned about their gross mistreatment and they want action. Their advocates want action, their families want action, and we want action. Uh, when the Reuters uh, uh, three journalists did their, their, their investigative report, they found that these countries, uh, the TIP office had recommended a tier three, and lo and behold, it was changed as it went up the ladder. I asked Secretary of State John Curry about it at a hearing. I believe in total transparency, and he said he made the decisions that this, the, uh, the uh, buck stopped there. Uh, for example, Malaysia, the TPP said you could not join that trade um, uh, agreement if you were on, on the on tier three of the trafficking uh, uh, victims protection act uh, list all of a sudden they get a passing grade i talked to the people in thailand um, their diplomatic corps uh, a lot of those who were involved with tip they were shocked they said they're worse than we are when it comes to labor trafficking in particular so i i raised that as an issue same thing happened with um, uh, the issue of IRFA, where countries have not been uh, designated as CPC countries because of, quote, other considerations. And I, that, that is through Democrat and Republican administrations. And even in the, the Sean and David Goldman International Child Abduction and Prevention Act, which was started when a constituent of mine had his son abducted to Brazil, Took me five years to get that law enacted. It is enacted. So when the report came out, first one, second one, third one, Japan was treated with kid gloves. Uh, and very, very falsely, uh, the narrative didn't match up. The numbers didn't match up with the reality. Uh, so again, I had several hearings uh, taking the administration to task on that. And that's through both Republican and Democrat administrations as well. So a big lesson, you might want to speak to this, learn from all of this, whether it's a friend or foe, when somebody's being tortured or maltreated, human rights abuses are, are being committed against them. Um, they don't care how close we are as a country or not. We need to call it as it is. I tried for 10 years to get China designated as tier three uh, um, based on their record, uh, particularly with the Lao Gai uh, and, and all of the other problems that they have uh, with, with forced labor. Uh, and we couldn't do it. They're now on tier three as they should be. But it, it, it was really like pulling teeth uh, because we didn't want to offend uh, the Chinese dictatorship, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, by putting them on that list. So selective application and the selective fact patterns uh, that then omit important information, let's not let that happen to the Global Magnitsky Act uh, through time or uh, right away You know, as we're, as we're working on it. So some of you might want to speak to that. Uh, if I, if you would, I would also, Michael Breen, you had mentioned uh, that we allow sanctions based on an individual status as a leader of an abusive or a corrupt organization, and this has been a goal of the international accountability measures uh, for years, uh, so that senior leaders cannot cloak themselves in the impunity afforded by assigning the guilt of their policies or inaction to subordinates. Now, I included the principle of respondeat superior in the Belarus Democracy, Human Rights and Sovereignty Act of 2020 for that very reason. 
so that officials responsible for ordering human rights abuses would be held accountable right up to the very top, uh, not just the subordinates who carry out their terrible orders. And I'm wondering if any of you would want to speak to the issue, uh, respondeat uh, superior, in the Global Mandisky Act. Uh, do you think there's any tension or, or what would be the interplay between this important principle, and it is an important principle, and the notion of sovereign immunity, uh, which will be carted out, I'm sure, um, uh, uh, by the offending countries. Uh, I also I have other questions, but that is a start. Um, but again, if you could speak to really this issue of of selective uh, information gathering, you know, friends get off easier. That just undermines our whole human rights uh, credibility. And I can't tell you how upset our friends in Thailand were. They have their own problems for real. Uh, because they looked at nearby Malaysia and said, why are you giving them a pass? Thank you, Congressman. I, I, I appreciate both of your questions. I, I think to the question of selectivity and, and emissions uh, against, against U.S. allies in particular, we'd agree that the Global Magnitsky Program has not been used in some situations where it would be inappropriate. Um, right. And we note that the perception of selectivity is a threat to the legitimacy and the effectiveness of sanctions tools. We're constantly working with NGOs to help them submit sanctions recommendations that focus on some of these gaps. Um, but I'd also stress that without the Global Magnitsky Program, much of that advocacy would stand little, little chance of success, given how unlikely it is that the U.S. government would ever establish a country-specific sanctions program focused on an allied country. I mean, it, that's extraordinarily difficult to imagine uh, and require a massive effort by civil society. So. I guess I'd caution against too sweeping a critique about the implementation of the program itself. Um, some of the sanctions that, that I and my colleagues today have mentioned targeted powerful and well-connected individuals or companies and treaty allies or other countries with which the U.S. government has close relations. We could talk about uh, Dan Gertler in the DRC, Lemberg's in Latvia, the Saudi officials in any that were sanctioned, uh, and so on. So um, there's room for improvement, but, but I also think the tool is absolutely valuable. Well, it better than my question is the whole idea that let's let's be more consistent. Um, you know, it, credibility is important in human rights. Um, and so, and I do get your points, and, and I appreciate them. Anybody else want to speak to that? I'll just weigh in for a minute. Um, just on your trafficking point, I teach human trafficking here at Stanford Law School, and I brought a student group um, for a study abroad in Thailand, and actually we had the same experience. Everyone was asking us what had happened with Malaysia. So I, I, I really think that is a real concern about the efficacy and also the legitimacy, perceived legitimacy of the program. On your responding at superior point, I think it's incredibly important because leaders of these organizations and entities are the ones who have the ability to change policy and to, frankly, deal with problems within their ranks. And so if there are lower level individuals who are responsible for the depredations that we're seeing, it should fall to the leader to fix those um, and to address it. And that offers a nice opportunity for an off ramp. If they can then come back and say, look at what I've done. I've in I've initiated an investigation. I've sacked these five people. We've referred the matter to law enforcement. And then the entity or the individual can have themselves delisted. And so you mentioned the term buck stops at the top. And I think that's the case with respect to leaders in, of these entities and organizations. Anybody else? If, if I could, um, yeah, just, just briefly, um, I, just a, a couple of points. One is, um, I mean, to highlight what, what Mike said in the Dan Gertler case, I mean, there you have, uh, you know, Dan Gertler had been a target for a long time, an Israeli citizen in the DRC, and concern was about how, you know, that the ally of the government of Israel would be responding. The, the sanctions were really important when they were imposed in 2017 and 2018, and I think the, the backtracking at the end of the last administration was a real concern and really a, a sort of highlight of the issue of what happens when there is that interference, and it was really important um, for the Biden administration to to reimpose the sanctions, to revoke that license, and again, be clear about the messaging. This is not an action against the government of Israel. It is an action against a citizen who was involved in corrupt action. I think too often uh, in other contexts, we are concerned that any sanctions come across as sanctions against the whole, and as we've talked about, the targeted nature of global magnitsky allows 
um, for for sort of that scalpel-like use with clear messaging. If you look at Sudan, for example, which is undergoing a transition, uh, which the United States is strongly supporting, there remain elements in Sudan that are uh, that are involved in corruption and, and and human rights abuse, including in Darfur. Use of sanctions against those actors could be a critically important way of not penalizing Sudan, but rather highlighting the bad actors that we need to isolate and move to the side in order for, uh, to, to, sorry, to, to see the Sudanese government be able to move these bad actors to the side, to have them under pressure so that there is, um, you know, not a, uh, you know, a sort of a, a backsliding of what happened there. The UAE is another example of an ally. Obviously, they plays a strategic role in many parts of the world. Uganda, similarly, um, where illicit gold trafficking, illicit diamond trafficking, illicit natural resources trafficking continues. And to be able to sanction key actors involved in those places, not as an action against those governments as a whole or those populations as a whole, but rather with clear messaging around those things could, could enable us to move away from this selective application problem. Um, I do think there is a balance between kind of more broader application and overuse, and that's always going to be a, a, a tension. And I think that's something that, you know, again, reporting and transparency that has been talked about would be helpful. And, and just briefly on the respondeat superior uh, point, uh, you know, we could not agree more. Certainly, our, you know, as the century, we have looked closely at the idea that leaders and those at the top of hijacked states, of kleptocracies, uh, and the, you know, whether it's the businesses or the ministries, that enable those systems to be in power. Targeting the leaders of those uh, is really critical to changing the landscape on the ground. And uh, if you just go after, you know, the one sort of middling commander about whom there's a bit of evidence, you've completely lost the opportunity both to um, to deliver a clear message, to, to establish again, as we talked about, a clear policy. And, and as has been said, to really deliver a message to civil society and human rights defenders that we understand the dynamics on the ground and we see that the leaders of these entities, of these ministries, of these businesses are the ones that can change uh, policy. And, and, you know, to Tutu's point consistently, if the, if the type of actors that Tutu pointed out were targeted, it would have the ability to change the dynamic on the ground in Equatorial Guinea, and I think we all we all want to see that. So I, I think those are exactly the right directions in terms of questions, uh, Co-Chair Smith. Mr. Smith? Yes, I, yes. Yeah, I just yield me one second. I just wanted to uh, say that, unfortunately, I have to go on a leadership call, but I, um, I again, um, um, I appreciate you being willing to take over. Um, but I just want to, again, thank the panel. Um, this has been excellent, and... Um, and we will certainly be in touch with you as we continue to figure out how uh, we're going to draft this in a way that um, you know reflects a lot of the issues that were raised here today. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. You're back. Thanks. Thank Thanks. You Thanks. Let me just again underscoring the importance of being willing to call it as it is. Uh, the Bush administration did an amazing thing. It shouldn't be amazing, but it was obviously two of our closest allies on the face of the earth are Israel and South Korea, and yet both of them were put on tier three uh, pursuant to the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. And I met with their diplomats, their ambassadors especially, throughout the year uh, in the hopes that they would not be, their, their hope that they would not be sanctioned after being put on that list of, um, of egregious yes, violators. And they Check really the, took- uh, Hearing people. Uh, hello? And their actions, um, they closed up brothels in, in Tel Aviv. Uh, the the uh, government of uh, South Korea passed incredibly effective legislation uh, to combat human trafficking, uh, all because we were willing to call it as it existed. So again, this whole idea of selected application, I, I think we, we do everyone um, a, a tremendous service, particularly victims or potential victims, when we are absolutely fearless in saying it the way it is, including towards Saudi Arabia, which I think we missed uh, in not calling out um, um, uh, the person who seems to have been the mastermind uh, for the Khashoggi murder. So let me ask maybe one final question um, uh, with regards to China. Obviously, the most re recent meeting between Secretary of State Blinken uh, and the Chinese foreign minister in Alaska highlighted yet again 
Uh, the Chinese Communist Party's egregious violations of human rights, including genocide against the Uyghurs, the ongoing repression of Tibet, uh, religious persecution. We know that that under uh, Xi Jinping, uh, under uh, Xi, President Xi, uh, that they are, you all know it, they are trying to completely and fundamentally alter all religious belief so it comports with uh, Xi Jinping's communist principles. Uh, 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 and that's going on systematically. Uh, we also know that there's the pervasive use of torture and forced abortion and the crushing of labor rights and ILO standards. Uh, I'm going, I have to leave at around 2.45 to three. There's a local um, um, uh, company called Shredit in, in uh, nearby, um, in Hamilton right now, they're over in Lawrenceville. They're trying to unionize and they're having a big rally uh, at three o'clock. Uh, and you know there are people who are trying to apparently make it more difficult for the workers to organize. But in China, good luck. I had hearings where I had people who tried to organize a genuine labor union, not the bogus one run by the Chinese government, uh, and they were incarcerated and they were beaten uh, and, and maltreated as were their families. So um, I, I'm very glad that, that you know, as a, we are bipartisan and standing up. I am concerned though, that since many of our sanctions, uh, you know, are predicated on the whole idea of of disallowing the ability to have access to banking, not just cutting off the ability to uh, uh, travel here with a visa. Uh, do any of you find it worrying, and what might you suggest, that we may be unwittingly incentivizing countries like China, Russia, and Iran to explore ways to replace the United States dollar as the world reserve currency uh, and de facto currency of foreign commerce? Uh, they will do it for other reasons, of course, but we don't want them to do it also. Uh, you know, we need to have a, a better strategy to, to mitigate that possibility because then our sanctions will be far less effective uh, when we when we single out individuals in China or elsewhere or Russia. So your thoughts on that? Thank you, Congressman. I'm happy to, to start. Um, Thank you. So I agree with you on all the points. First, on, on your first point on sort of sanctions against China in general, I, I mean, I think China is an interesting case and it really highlights my point about using sanctions as one tool as part of a broader toolbox, right? I, I do think that the like Nitsky sanctions that were imposed recently over Xinjiang were, were quite a good step. I think that there's more that they can do there. I think it's great that they worked in concert with allies. I think there's also more that they can do there. Uh, you know, similar with Hong Kong, there's more that they can do there. But as you know well, you know, the U.S. government has also used, for example, export controls recently to go after companies that are involved in surveillance in Xinjiang. Right, we started to use you know other uh, potential uh, ICT trade restrictions uh, on imports from China, uh, et cetera. And so I think it's it's interesting to think about where sanctions fit in the broader toolkit with China. And China really is a very special case there. And so I think it's you know all tools need to be used uh, with global Magnitsky being sort of a, a key part of it. On your point about the use of the U.S. dollar, I mean it's certainly something that I follow closely and that a lot of people are talking about. As you're right, you know, the reason why sanctions are very effective is because of the primacy of the U.S. dollar, because it's used in virtually all international trade, uh, as well as the size of the U.S. economy. And so, uh, you know, when you get cut off uh, from the U.S. financial system, as you rightly said, it often means that you're essentially cut off from all global financial systems and you can't really do anything uh, with, you know, no international banks will touch you, et cetera. And so it's a very important tool. Uh, and without that leverage, I would argue, you know, sanctions become obviously less effective. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do them in concert with allies. The more that we can do that and multilateralize it, the better. But frankly, you know, when people get sanctioned by the U.S., it, it really does have the most sort of direct impact uh, through the financial system. Now, I actually think that sort of the, the issue is a bit overblown in the sense that I don't think that the U.S. dollar is going to be, you know, uh, going anywhere anytime soon. I think it will continue to be the de facto global currency for a long time. Uh, and I think that we should continue to, you know, to utilize the tool uh, with that in mind. That said, uh, I do think you make a good point uh, in that we should be, you know, thinking about this now. We should be working with our partners to think about how we can do this together. The more that we do it together, the less it becomes a U.S. issue and an issue of the U.S. dollar, because then they also can't use the euro, they can't use the pound, they can't use the yen, uh, et cetera. And so I think that that's important. Now, regardless of what we do, it, it is very true that China will also continue to do whatever it can uh, to make the yuan a global currency, uh, and I think to compete with the U.S. on, on all levels. And I, you know, I, I don't think that 
global Magnitsky itself is going to stop that, of course, but I do think that we need to be smart about its use. And that's why I think, you know, being very targeted in our sanctions policy, I think, um, you know, thinking about it as part of a broader strategy, as I said, where the tool fits in, uh, thinking about the potential uh, uh, collateral impact uh, on uh, the international financial system, on uh, global economies, uh, et cetera. I think all of that is important. And I think the more that we can do that and think about it, you know, sort of five to 10 years out as we do these actions, the better, because, you know, eventually this will not be the case. And so I think we need to, you know, uh, preserve our, our, our sort of uh, ability to do this. Uh, and that means not overusing sanctions, not just imposing them on anybody because we can, but actually embedding them as part of a policy and doing it the right way. Excuse, thank you very much. Anybody else uh, want to speak to that? I'll just conclude and, and I'll ask that uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, uh, if she could continue the hearing. Um, I do have to speak at a rally. Uh, it's a organizing rally uh, in Lawrenceville, New Jersey uh, from Shredit where they're trying to become part of the Teamsters. Uh, and I'm due there at three o'clock and it's across town. So I'm gonna have to leave in a moment. But I would like to ask um, um, or just make mention, we sometimes underestimate the impact that sanctions does have on uh, the behavior of dictatorships. Charles Taylor never thought uh, he would be indicted and brought to justice uh, uh, 50 years at The Hague uh, for his crimes. Uh, I remember I met with Bashir in Khartoum in 2005, and all he wanted to talk about was sanctions, um, you know, lifting up, that is. Uh, when I met with Lukashenko, and I met with him twice in Minsk, uh, the first time it was very, very hostile. Uh, he, he called me public enemy number one, I am the author of the Belarus Democracy Act of 2004, which actually is the template for the Banditsky Act, you know, the sanctions uh, on individuals with regards to, to visa and the ability to do business. Uh, and just a little aside, when he, uh, when they served tea to our delegation, um, uh, Lloyd Daggett was sitting to my right, and it was soon after he had made this tirade uh, uh, against the Belarus Democracy Act, uh, which he felt was feeling the impact of, Many prisoners were released, we think, because of the pressure, uh, political prisoners. Um, the, um, I, I pushed my tea over to, over to Lloyd Daggett and said, you want my tea? I mean, these guys are, are, are really, they get the message. And if it's consistently applied, I think it has, it helps to encourage, uh, you know, there's always some reformers inside almost any. Can you hear me? Almost any dictatorship. And the hope is that they will. That we're, the hope is that they will be empowered within that administration uh, to push for reforms or at least to mitigate some of the most egregious behaviors. So thank you to this tremendous panel. Uh, we look forward to working with you as we go forward. And I would like to ask Sheila uh, Jackson if she can take over because I have to go over to this rally. I appreciate that. Thank you, Sheila. I'm excited to be here with both Chairman and Co-Chair, Chairman McGovern and Co-Chair Smith. We have served on the Tom Lantos Commission for a very long time. As I begin, let me acknowledge the eight persons who lost their life in Atlanta, six of whom were Asian American women, and of course, the mass murder that occurred in Boulder, Colorado. As we look at human rights, even though these individuals wound up tragically deceased at the hands of murderers whose full uh, motive has not been determined, we know in the United States, we must continue to fight for the human rights of others and for the recognition of difference and the acceptance of the dignity of people who are different. Whether in religion or race or ethnicity, we have our fights to engage in as well. As we look internationally, it is important to have all the tools necessary for America to regain her high moral ground lost over the last four years in the present administration, ignoring the violations of human dignity, the killing of journalists, and the brutalization of women. So let me start with Mr. Breen on one of the suggestions you made about the expansion of this act uh, beyond human rights defenders and whistleblowers. Would you comment on how that would uh, provide America with that high moral ground, but particularly as it may relate to China and some of the human rights violations on the continent of Africa in particular. Mr. Breen? Yes, Congressman, thank you. Um, thank you very much. And I, I hope you can hear me. Um, but thank you very, very much for the question. I, you know, I think the, the fundamental moral point that you've made stands 
um, human rights abuse is human rights abuse. Um, to be victimized is to be victimized. Um, and and this, uh, this instrument uh, ought to allow uh, for us to, to find justice for crimes against all persons. So I think that's a very important expansion. On China, um, there's been some discussion of that earlier in the hearing. I would echo uh, much what's been said there. Uh, I would just again highlight, we're, we're very pleased to note uh, that the EU, the UK, and Canada announced on March 22nd that they'd imposed their first sanctions on several Chinese Communist Party officials and other entities who are responsible for atrocities against Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities in Xinjiang. Uh, in addition to the additional sanctions that were announced by the United States, against the Chinese Communist Party officials. So this marks again, as I mentioned in my, my opening remarks, the first time all four partners have used global magnitude sanctions to take a coordinated and simultaneous action against human rights abusers. Um, and it follows on a, a great deal of other activism, including a similar set of US sanction actions in July, 2020, a call from 70 NGOs that Human Rights First, among others, led in August, encouraging other governments to use their own targeted sanctions authorities to help address the situation. Uh, in Xinjiang and Western China. So uh, we've consistently encouraged the United States and other governments with targeted sanctions authorities for human rights and corruption to prioritize coordinating their actions uh, and sharing information with one another. That's particularly important in the case of China because changing behavior and providing accountability for abuses like those occurring in Xinjiang is just going to be very difficult. Um, targeted sanctions, as my colleagues have mentioned, that's a critical element, but it has to be an element of a broader strategy to that end that encompasses all of American foreign policy. Um, and that's especially true when multiple governments reinforce the impact and legitimacy of each other's actions through that multilateral approach. But, but hopefully we saw that happen earlier this week and we hope to see more of it. Let me ask Professor Van Scheck um, the uh, impact that the Malinsky Act has on the issue of sex trafficking, human trafficking, which are truly human rights violations and how we can expand this legislation uh, and refine the language so that we include, which has become an increasing scourge, not only internationally, but sadly here in the United States, clearly these women's rights are being violated, their human rights are being violated. And unfortunately for a long period of time because human traffic and or sex traffic victims can be utilized or recycled over and over again. Professor Vanchek? Yeah, thank you very much for that question, uh, Congresswoman. It's really an important one and it's something that's near and dear to me. I've worked long and hard on issues of gender-based and sexual violence. And so I would love to see the Global Magnitsky Act be better utilized to address um, issues concerning women and children. The original definition of gross human rights violations, which appears in the original GLOMAG language, is tied to another statute that defines that term. And I, I just pulled it up here. Um, it's torture, cruel, and human integrating treatment or punishment, prolonged detention without trial, causing the disappearances of persons, and other flagrant denials of the right to life, liberty, and the security of persons. Now, I think that um, sexual violence, human trafficking, forced labor, can fall within those definitions, but it's not specifically called out. And so I think as a result, we don't tend to do as many designations or reporting with respect to those types of conduct. And so one option would be to just broaden the types of acts that the Glo Global Magnitsky Act applies to. Um, the, the S93, which is the Senator's suggestion for how to do this, would use serious human rights abuses, but without definition. And so I could imagine a, a melding of the two where we would use that language, but then list some exemplary acts that would qualify as serious human rights abuses. And that would be able to capture the kind of gender violence that you're interested in seeing addressed. I also think we can coordinate more closely with our anti-trafficking regime. We have a whole range of trade restrictions that are available to us under US law. And we could be coordinating those trade restrictions in the trafficking context with global Magnitsky sanctions that are happening in the sanctions context. And that requires some cross-governmental coordination. And the State Department has recently um, announced that there will be reappointing a sanctions coordinator. And that might be a good role for that person to play to make sure that we're literally pulling on all of the levers that we have available to us when we're dealing with human trafficking and forced labor.
Thank you, Professor Vanshack. I'm getting your answers delayed, so please forgive us, but I'm determined to get my last questions in. And so I'd like uh, Mr. Uh, Brad Brooks Rubin and Mr. Hughes, uh, and as well, um, let me start with uh, Mr. Tutu Alicante um, for a first question to him, and then a second question for Mr. Hughes and Mr. Brad Brooks Rubin, if I might. Um, Mr. Uh, Alicante, you uh, mentioned uh, corruption uh, and uh, sometimes the difficulty of uh, this corruption being weeded out uh, both um, in terms of the actors that may wind up uh, in the Western world and then those uh, in Africa. What can we do uh, with respect to the Maganinsky Human Rights Act to make it a more effective tool for helping you in the work that you are doing? Mr. Alicante, if you would answer that, if you can remember that, then I'd like to uh, focus on Mr. Hughes and Mr. Brooks Rubin uh, to comment on the failure of our actions or the um, greater tools that are needed to address uh, the actions that seem to continue in China, a very huge country that probably uh, could estimate uh, a whole state population here in the United States that they have as political prisoners or more. And of course the actions or non-actions taken in the murder of the Washington Post journalism, journalist as relates to Saudi Arabia and the world, frankly, in terms of their seemingly inaction dealing uh, with that particular uh, heinous act. So first to Mr. Alicante, did you hear my question? Yes, Congresswoman, I did. Hello. In Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So thank you very much. Um, Congresswoman, we, EG Justice, the organization I direct, along with the Human Rights Watch and Human Rights First, over a year ago have filed a request for sanctions against Theodore Ng. So one concrete thing that Congress can do, or one concrete thing that the U.S. can do, is actually look at that report and issue sanctions against Mr. Theodorin. The other members of other uh, high level officials of the Equatorial Guinean government um, that also deserve to be looked at uh, carefully and perhaps to use sanctions under the Globe Mag applied against them. But I think more broadly, the issue of selective application is one that you know people like myself and other activists in Equatorial Guinea and in all of Africa want us to look at very very carefully. I welcome Congressman Smith uh, uh, highlighting Belarus and highlighting Liberia. Many of us uh, welcome also what happened with Honduras, and we ask ourselves how is it that Equatorial Guinea, that Freedom House, Transparency International. All these different organizations ranks at the bottom of the bottom with Turkmenistan, with South Sudan, with Eritrea, does not get the same scrutiny. How is it that Uganda does not get the same scrutiny? And we have seen what happens when elections happen in Uganda uh, a couple of months ago, and the brutality with which uh, the Museveni regime went after the opposition. So we want to see that, you know, in Equatorial Guinea, another big problem, you know, is that of, of human trafficking and sex trafficking by high level members of the Equatorial Guinean government. So we want to see this law apply more broadly. And this is a case, Equatorial Guinea, in which the bug actually stops with President Obiang. And President Obiang and his son, who is the vice president, are the ones responsible for all this criminal behavior, are the ones responsible for all the corruption. And very, very importantly, the point I tried to make earlier is that none of this crime, none of the transnational kleptocracy that Equatorial Guinea is characterized by would happen but for the complicity, but for the non tacit complicity of U.S. lawyers, U.S. bankers, U.S. accountants, U.S. real estate and escrow agents. So it's very, very critical that that fight against kleptocracy starts here in the U.S. looking at these enablers. Thank you very much. Um, 
Thank you, Representative Jackson Lee, uh, for the questions and, and, and for your leadership uh, across the board on, on so many issues. Um, I think to your questions on, um, on, on China in particular, uh, you know, it's not a, an issue that my organization, the Century, focuses on at the moment, but I will say that, that some of the tools that we've seen used in other situations can, uh, can apply, I, I believe, to the situation in Xinjiang. For example, there has been uh, reintroduced the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act uh, in Congress. Uh, that legislation builds on supply chain regulation that we have seen in other contexts, including conflict minerals that, that uh, you know, has worked in, uh, in Eastern Congo and elsewhere to ensure that companies are doing the necessary due diligence and reporting on their supply chains. That is a critical tool. Um, that can also be extended beyond uh, our borders. The conflict minerals legislation, for example, has been used, you know, has been adopted in the EU. It's there are due diligence guidance that the OECD has. Um, similarly, there are broader due diligence requirements that you know the US government has used in the past. For example, the Burma Responsible Investment Reporting Requirements was a, a unique tool used as we were easing sanctions on Burma but requiring companies that are investing in a, in a country to report publicly on the due diligence they've taken on key issues. It's a different version of the same idea of ensuring the private sector is, is taking their responsibilities and frankly ensuring that the American public is aware of where their goods come from. I think with respect to both you know, Xinjiang and Saudi Arabia, the increasing use of uh, anti-money laundering tools, uh, the Financial Crimes Invest Enforcement Network, FinCEN, which is uh, another agency at Treasury, has the ability to issue advisories uh, or other more direct letters to ensure that actors that are involved uh, are not just seen for the sort of political tool that sanctions are, but rather more directly for the criminal activity that they're involved in. You, you talked you know, eloquently about a range of the crimes that we've seen both here and abroad any money laundering is, is, is the lane through which those criminal proceeds then find their way into the legitimate financial system and, and encouraging FinCEN uh, and, and through FinCEN other financial intelligence units and the broader uh, international community that looks at any money laundering, that looks at terror finance and corruption starts to address these issues more directly. Again, it need not be, you know, wholesale, you know, action against, um, entire governments, but rather the more focused, targeted action that can take different lanes. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think that kind of transparency and pressure uh, can be really effective. Thank you, Congresswoman. I think I, I, I agree with everything that, that Brad said. Uh, maybe just to add a couple things on my end. I mean, first, his point on leveraging other tools is right. I mean, particularly in the Xinjiang context, as he said, there's you know already legislation under consideration they're looking at some of the supply chain issues. I think the US government could also do more in concert with allies to highlight, you know, specifically what actions China is actually taking in Xinjiang, uh, you know, uh, ideally declassifying any intelligence that they have on that, uh, making it clear for uh, the private sector in particular uh, on what the expectations are for their engagement in the region. Uh, I think, you know, doing some some guidance from the Treasury Department and the Commerce Department and others on what they expect the private sector to do. Often it is the private sector that is, uh, you know, the, the most exposed here. And I think where, where, where it will get uh, China's attention. Uh, of course, there's also other tools they consider, for example, through diplomatic outreach, you know, China has the Olympics coming up, of course, and, you know, they can look at whether there's ways to, you know, potentially discourage uh, certain activities related to that uh, in concert with allies. I think they even need to you know, consider that more fully, but, you know, that is an example of the type of actions that they can take. I think my point here is that you need to think about all of these in context uh, and think about where the pressure points are, what tools you have to address them, uh, and again, bring allies on board to do that. You know, that is similar to Saudi Arabia, right, where they already took, you know, a lot of steps related to uh, Khashoggi, of course, they named a whole new sanctions program, uh, uh, after him, uh, but that is just one step, as you say, you know, there's also because they are a key US ally. There's also diplomatic pressure that can be brought to bear. Uh, I think, you know, looking at uh, the relationship more broadly and where the US government is supporting them in the region, for example, or through you know, the sale of weapons and, and other things like that. I think we need to look at all of that uh, in context. And this is why in my testimony, I talked about 
the strategy and sort of putting the sanctions in context, right? Uh, they're not a panacea. Uh, I don't think that, you know, using just sanctions towards either Saudi Arabia or China or anywhere, frankly, is, is going to achieve the policies that we want. Uh, and so I think it's clearly laying out what the policies are and how sanctions can be part of them uh, that is most important here. Let me thank you very much for uh, the testimony, specifically on those questions. And as I conclude the hearing, let me raise one last question and let any of you who can take that question because it is specifically pointed, and that is on the crisis with Ethiopia and Eritrea, and in particular, uh, the utilization of a religious sect uh, to be at the brunt of massive human rights violations by soldiers. Uh, where women are being raped. And my constituents who are in this community are uh, crying out for help, Ethiopians, uh, and I know um, the uh, Eritrean community, because this has been an ongoing uh, conflict for decades. Having known previous presidents and having worked directly with those presidents in those two countries trying to resolve it, it is um, a conflict uh, really surrounded uh, by uh, one would say the worst conditions possible and the worst conditions possible for having any form of reconciliation. So anyone wants to take specifically uh, that question dealing with that area right now in terms of the human rights violations and whether uh, there are tools that we need beyond uh, the Minitsky Act. Uh, and finally, let me just say, um, as it relates to Burma, there are many constituents that are in my community dealing with that question, I know that we'll have to address it as we recently did with two initiatives on the floor of the house that we passed legislation dealing with the condemnation of those actions in Burma. But let me just refer the question of Ethiopia and Eritrea as relates to human rights violations. Anyone wanna take that question, please? Professor Van Schaak or Mr. Breen? I would just very quickly comment and thank you for raising it. Um, I, I think this, uh, this point that you've made really illustrates the importance of the serious human rights abuse standard that's in the executive order, but is not yet part of the legislation. Um, the, the legislation is driving, it, 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 the tool currently is flexible enough to address rape and sexual violence by foreign officials, soldiers, security forces, and the like. But without that serious human rights abuse standard uh, that's in the executive order, uh, we could not target non-state militias who perpetrate those same crimes, um, both in Ethiopia and Eritrea and around the world. And, and, and that's a major issue um, since many of those crimes are perpetrated by non-state militias. Um, so in, in terms of, as you think about reauthorization and, and, and drafting reauthorization, again, uh, as, as I think most of us have, urge you to, to adopt that standard and, and, and define it clearly. I'll just echo that. I think it is a more flexible standard. It's it's broader. It enables you to bring in more conduct, but then, as just mentioned, you can reach more actors. And so, to the extent that you are looking at violence that's being committed by non-state actors, by militias, et cetera, with deniable ties to state authorities, it is helpful to have the executive order language rather than the GLOMAG language, which really does restrict to state action. Uh um, I, I'll just say briefly, I, I, I think it's, I, thank you, Representative Jackson Lee, for, for raising those two cases. You know, I think they're, they're, they're an interesting contrast. Uh, you know, Ethiopia and Eritrea is an example where, uh, obviously, Senator Coons is, uh, is now, you know, on his way con conducting diplomacy. And I think seeing a clear policy direction from the Biden administration, I'm happy to continue. Um, just that these abuses, the abuses that we've seen in that in that region, should be um, uh, should be addressed as as part of a, a broader diplomatic effort. And, and again, this would be a situation where uh, abuses like those that have been reported uh, by Human Rights Watch and others need re a true true judicial accountability. Uh, they are war crimes, uh, and they should be prosecuted as such. If there are uh, leaders that can be 
uh, held to account for those three sanctions as a way of a broader diplomatic process, then that would be, you know, fully appropriate. Bur Burma is an example of a, a place that was subject to significant sanctions. Those sanctions were then eased, uh, and now we see the resumption of really problematic activity. You know, the Biden administration has been quick to impose some sanctions again. I think this is a, another situation where broader types of sanctions that really get at the, the financing of this junta are really critical. Um, so global Magnitsky is one tool, but other tools, again, in the anti-money laundering lane, as well as broader sectoral approaches might be necessary to truly change the, the situation on the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much for these thorough, in-depth responses to a very serious responsibility that Congress has. I'd like to think of the United States as the nurturer of human rights around the world, including within our own boundaries. And you have been uh, most uh, informative and uh, provocative, if you will, and challenged us to think how we can uh, renew uh, this reauthorization uh, for the Magnitsky Act. So again, on behalf of the Chairman McGovern, Co-Chairman Smith, and myself, uh, let me thank uh, Senator Cardin, uh, Mr. Breen, Mr. Bruce Rubin, uh, Professor Van Schaak, uh, and uh, Tutu Alicante, and uh, Professor uh, John Hughes uh, for your testimony today. And with that, uh, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you again.